compilation time. Just as a heads up for potential new viewers, the rules can be found in the description as well as being on screen at the moment. The mic quality picks up during this video back to this quality. And editing quality picks up as well, if you ask me. Have fun! Welcome to Heroes of Might and Magic 3, no unit loss. We start off quite simple with the easiest campaign in the game, where we once and for all show that monarchies are superior to republics, of course. Long live the queen. I pick up the first aid tent as a scenario bonus. On day one, I recruit all the free units around me, head to town and recruit Adelaide, who has a few archers on her. I upgrade all the archers to marksmen, leave the rest of my army in town and buy a spellbook. Also hoping for the cure spell, but not getting it in this case. With Christian, I can take advantage of his ballista to make fights easier, which makes him a natural main hero. Splitting the marksmen into more stacks makes fights against the upcoming hellhounds possible to do. If using a single stack, chances are high I would lose at least one unit, as at least one stack of hellhounds would reach my melee weak marksmen. Since the building strategy I use needs a lot of wood, Adelaide's mission in the first week is to collect as much wood and gold from the sea as possible. So she's off to the boat. West of the starting town is a stables, increasing my hero movement for the week, making my strategy possible. Every chest is also used for experience in order to reach the max scenario level of 6. The first scenario is extremely easy, should you not care about unit losses. You can literally rush the objective town and win super fast, only limited by your movement points. However, when not allowed to lose units, things become slightly more complicated. After a bit of trial and error, I found the most consistent strategy to be to rush cavaliers and castle in week 1, having my main hero in town on week 1 day 7, upgrading to champions on week 2 day 1, and then heading for the objective town with an army of just 6 champions. North of my starting town, I'm collecting some permanent stats, namely 1 defense, 1 attack and knowledge, while also collecting more experience. Stats and spells carry over to the other campaign scenarios, so this is very helpful. By day 5, Adelaide has collected enough wood and gold and heads back to land. I park the boat in this specific hex in order to maximize movement. In case you didn't know, your hero loses all movement for the day when boarding a boat. And since my plan is for Christian to travel by boat to the west next week, this hex makes him able to reach land again in just two days worth of movement. Having collected everything he needs, Christian heads back to town. Still not quite level 6, but that will be reached before the scenario is finished anyway. Adelaide's new job is to help Christian's on water movement by flagging a lighthouse to the west, and then to reach level 6 herself using the marksman like Christian did earlier. This specific boat hex is always reachable with the stables boost and cavalier movement. Your hero's overworld movement is based on the slowest units in its army, so I keep only the cavalier, my fastest unit so far, and Christian to maximize his movement. From here until I reach the objective town is smooth sailing. While Christian heads for the town, Adelaide is collecting as much experience and stats as possible. The skills I choose each level up has some logic to it, but I will explain more at the end of the next scenario. For the experienced Heroes 3 player, it might be obvious, but the skills are semi-random, so there is some luck to it, and the final skill trees for both Christian and Adelaide are quite bad. In the final battle of this scenario, if I'm too slow to reach this town, the AI would have built up to at least a citadel, making me take more unavoidable damage. This would make the healing from the cure spell necessary. In some trial runs using different strategies, the AI even built up to a castle, making it practically impossible to do this without losses as the arrow towers do too much damage to heal up. The strategy in this case, since I don't have the cure spell, is to use magic arrows and the ballista to whittle down the ranged unit of the beholders. The other ranged unit, the medusas, only have 4 shots, so they will need to come out and fight in melee sooner than the beholders. Now you also see why I picked the first aid tent as a bonus in the beginning, healing my injured champion up each round. After a few rounds of whittling down, the AI finally starts moving towards me. The AI forces are no match against my champions, making them easy pickings. When we have completed the first scenario, yay us! Only two more to go. The next scenario, Guardian Angels, is easily the easiest in this campaign. The objective is simply to eliminate all Brown's heroes and towns, and to help us do this, we get a ton of free angels in the beginning, including an angel as a scenario bonus. 
the strategy is quite simply to just run the AI down with the angels. In this run, I send Adley to exterminate the AI using only the one bonus angel from the scenario bonus, which is something I haven't tried before. But since she has the offense skill from the last scenario and a lot of spell power, I figured I could take the AI on with just the one angel. Christian then puts all the starting army in the town, recruits the surrounding angels, and then starts collecting resources for their later scenario strategy. The fights for the portals of glory are very straightforward. Surprisingly, the AI attacks Adelaide with the Soul Angel, and I didn't win in quick combat. However, due to her high power, I can simply magic arrow their forces down. We also see the power of the Angel against the low tier units. Simple victory. The AI has four towns in this scenario, one in each corner of the underground. Two dungeon towns and two inferno towns. Both of these factions can have magic guilds to level 5, which might become relevant later. Trying to stop the AI from collecting too many resources in the overworld, I recruit the third hero, Mephala, whose only job is to flag mines around my town and collect stuff. Recruiting Mephala to do this means I can send Christian towards the underground, flagging mines along the way as well. Beating the AI on this map is usually very easy. They rarely attack, and if they do, some well-placed magic usually takes care of them quite quickly. Sometimes, neutral fights are actually harder than hero fights, funnily enough. The main objective for me in this scenario, apart from the actual scenario objective, is to build up the magic guilds in the captured inferno and dungeon towns, and then to use the high-level spells I get from the AI towns in the final maps of this campaign. This is why I chose Wisdom at level 6 for Christian, a guaranteed skill at that level. The spells I look for are some sort of AoE spell, like Meteor Shower or Chain Lightning, Overworld mobility spells like Town Portal and Dimension Door, and Resurrection. This makes all fights possible to do quite early as well. In order to get the time and peace to build up all the magic guilds, I park one hero in front of the AI's last town. This makes it so they won't move, probably thinking I'm about to attack. Nonetheless, in every practice run I did, the AI's last town hadn't been built up, so I just casually let Adelaide stay with a bit of a weak army. In order to spare you for me essentially just picking up resources on the ground, trading resources to build up the magic guilds, and collecting some experience, let's time skip a bit. There are a couple of battles against Manticores and Pit Lords which can be a bit interesting. Against the Manticores, I actually thought the run would be over. In previous attempts, I've gone back to recruit more angels before taking this fight, so I was a bit worried. But for whatever reason, the AI just loves to focus the Ballista which probably saved me on this occasion. No idea why the AI has this Ballista fetish, but it's really abusable, especially early game in whatever map you're playing. Then again, had the AI actually been intelligent, a no unit loss like this in this game would probably be impossible anyway. The fight against the Pit Lords is quite interesting as well, because it is such a high experience fight. Pit Lords can raise demons from dead friendly stacks, so when they split up like this, they can, in theory, raise 6 new stacks of demons. Thankfully, their stats are quite bad, both the Pit Lords and the demons, compared to the angels. So this is probably easier than it looks for the untrained eye. You get experience for killing the raised demons as well as the Pit Lords, which is why it is a high experience fight. This is the last neutral fight in this scenario, which can potentially kill any of my units, so it's good to come out of it unscathed. For the first time, with the hero stationed in front of the AI's last town, in any practice run, I was attacked. Quite exciting, actually, because the AI never attacks if it doesn't think it has a good chance of winning. But this was probably just a desperation move of some sort. Good old Axis is easily dispatched of, and I continue with my plan. It does take a bit of maneuvering to avoid losing an angel though, as Axis has magic arrow available to him. Had I been careless, I would have lost an angel and needed to do it over again. Safety first. Which is why I cast slow in the beginning as well, lowering the odds of taking an unnecessary hit. It worked out in the end though. In the end, I am satisfied with getting Town Portal, Resurrection and Meteor Shower. Given that all of these spells are Earth spells, can also make good use of the earth magic skill, which I always pick up on this campaign. I, of course, have to visit the towns containing these spells, but after doing this, I quick combat the last fight and 
move on to the last scenario. The objective of the final scenario, Griffin Cliff, is to flag all Griffin dwellings located all the way north on the overworld. Two enemies are present this time, brown and orange, but they are allied, as far as I know at least, have their main towns in the underground, and won't attack each other. Starting with the Lion's Shield of Courage, giving plus 4 to all stats, the early strategy is to clear and flag all the mines using the starting army, Christian's Ballista, and the spells learned in the previous scenarios. Since getting to higher levels takes way more experience than lower levels, I pick up the gold instead of the experience from the chest in order to fund the scenario strategy, getting angels and running over the AI with them and high level magic. Getting gold income and resource income is pivotal, which is why I exclusively spend the first few days flagging mines and collecting resources. When I finally get my first angel, it's time to wreak some havoc. The layout of the map is quite symmetrical. There is one inferno town close to the roads on either side of my starting area. So I send Adelaide out to one side to explore and battle with her one angel. Since I got my first angel on day 7, the very next day I can recruit another one and send Christian to the other side. In order to have these two heroes be somewhat close in power, I keep the lion's shield on Christian so he can have a similar amount of knowledge and spell power as Adelaide. The risk of only having one unit on my hero is that should I misplay and that unit is killed, there won't be any opportunity to use Resurrect. So while this strategy is quite fast, it is not without risk. I encounter some AI scouting heroes, but since this is early game, meaning they have small and weak armies on an easy difficulty, there is virtually zero risk of losing these battles. I also make sure to build up to a castle in my main town making me able to recruit two angels the next week. The assault on the underground starts off with Adelaide heading down the western subterranean gate, taking the first underground dungeon town. There are three dungeon towns on the ground, one west, one east, and one south. To the north is a dragon utopia, which is not something I prioritize. While Adelaide is having her fun underground, Christian is kept busy by a few weak AI heroes one getting dangerously close to taking back one of the Inferno Towns. But since the stats and spells carry over from the previous campaign scenarios, literally every battle is easy, until the more difficult neutral ones later. That is, until Adelaide gets attacked by Orange's Dark Storm, who is a dungeon spellcaster hero. Superior spellcasting, combat mobility, tankiness, and brain power, let's be honest, make the difference. Additionally, I upgrade the Portal of Glory so the angels can be upgraded to the more powerful Archangels. However, in previous attempts, I have spent a couple more weeks collecting a bigger Archangel army. Thinking I would do the same thing in this attempt, I spent some time gathering resources, which turned out to be needless in this case, so let's just skip over this gathering part of the gameplay. The fights against the AI's heroes have been easy so far, there are a few neutral fights later, which can be a bit more challenging. In week 3, I town portal back to my main town to have two one stacks of Archangels on both my main heroes. The Archangel's resurrection ability is a handy backup tool, should I ever need it, but their superior combat stats are a good enough upgrade in it of itself. Both the castle towns in the overworld are guarded by quite a large neutral force. Though, here we can truly see the effect of the high-level combat spells learned in the previous scenarios. Meteor Shower, combined with the tankiness of the Archangels, makes this trivial and a super consistent strategy to use. We get another demonstration in the fight before the second overworld castle town. The neutral army composition is slightly different, but the outcome is the same. It would be slightly riskier to use Christian for this fight, as his ballista could be targeted by shooters and the Afriti Sultans but I wouldn't worry too much anyway. Had I actually been worried, I would have transferred the Ballista over to Mephala for safekeeping. The only thing left now is to flag the Griffin dwellings. In order to reach them, I have to pass some garrisons, which have semi-hard fights as well, compared to the hero fights, that is. I'm fairly sure I wouldn't need magic to win these fights, but I might as well. The garrison on the other side of the map has a similar fight that Christian takes care of. As mentioned previously, the AI makes a beeline towards the Ballista, once again proving just how much it hates the poor war machine. But no luck for the AI this time either, as the Ballista's 250 health is more than enough to tank a puny 12 hellhound stack. 
There are a couple more identical garrison fights, which I just skipped over, but we're not done with the hero fights. The last bosses await. Brown has a couple of stationary heroes standing perfectly still. Probably hoping my vision is based on movement, but unfortunately for them, I decided to smack them around a bit as well. These fights are the hardest hero fights in this campaign, which may say more about the campaign difficulty than my skill. Ash's 80 Hellhound stack can be a bit intimidating, but as the stack decided to cuddle up to the 30 Horn Demon stack, the AI made my choice of spell easy. A couple of Meteor Showers, which is probably Inferno Units' preferred way of cleaning themselves, let's be honest. And the Lightning Bolt, and Ash is defeated. And I completely forgot about this Red Dragon fight. Had I not had level 4 spells, Meteor Shower in this case, this could have been hard. Red Dragons are immune to level 1 to 3 magic, so my choices in the last scenario just keep paying off. The fight against Brown's last hero, Olemma, is a similar story to the fight against Ash. Meteor Shower, Archangel smacking with their swords, Lightning Bolt, finish with quick combat. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Visiting the Red Keymaster's tent opens up the opportunity to finish the scenario. Passing the red border gate, Adelaide gets the honor of flagging the last griffin dwelling. And with that, I can say we finished the campaign with zero unit loss. Long live my units, and long live the queen. If you wish to see more of this type of content, feel free to give this video a like and a comment. I plan on working my way through the campaigns, starting with the restoration of Erathia campaigns, then Armageddon's Blade, and then Shadow of Death. Can I do them all with zero unit loss? Let's find out. Welcome to Heroes of Might and Magic 3, No Unit Loss, Dungeons and Devils Campaign. I begin with the first scenario, a devilish plan. The objective is fairly straightforward, defeat the Gold Dragon Queen, aka a single Gold Dragon guarded by two Green Dragon fights, hidden behind a green border gate, which has its Keymaster's tent hidden behind a red border gate. We also face off against Red, who starts with four towns. A pretty uneven start compared to my single starting town. Red does not have to be defeated to win this scenario though. I start off with Pyre and get Marius from the tavern, which is quite nice. Pyre starts off with a Ballista, which is extremely useful in early fights. As mentioned in the Long Live the Queen video, the AI just loves to focus the 250 HP Ballista, making it a nice tank. Here I fight a bunch of Null Marauders, and due to the split in the stacks caused by the terrain, I take out the top 3 stacks using both my Hellhounds and the Ballista. Then I just stay out of range of the Nulls with my Hellhounds until they are low enough to finish them off. A fairly straightforward beginning. On day 2 I make sure to stop by the Red Keymaster's tent, which I have forgotten to do early a million times in practice runs. It is no big deal to forget it however, as I have plenty of time to pick it up later. I just try to avoid the annoyance. I also flag a neutral Rampart Town but I can't build anything in it, so it just serves as gold income. The early strategy, since I start off extremely resource rich, is to build a fire lake. After the fire lake, next on the list is the Forsaken Palace, in order to recruit devils. To do this, I need mercury. And to get mercury, I first need to flag the alchemist lab to the north. When I eventually, and by eventually I mean quite quickly, get devils, it's time to basically just run over red, as they never really build up their army in this scenario. I use the same Hellhound Ballista strategy against some Skeletons, Dwarves and Pikemen, taking advantage of my Hellhound's higher speed stat to kite neutral units around. Beating the Pikemen gives me access to the Alchemist Lab, and I now have Mercury income. On day 7, I have the 20 Mercury I need to build a Forsaken Palace. Building this on day 7 nets me one extra Devil compared to waiting until next week. And with these two Devils on week 2 day 1, it's time to wreak some havoc. I recruit all the available Efriti as well, keep the Devils on Marius, and trade the Efriti over to Pyre, so they both can do fights. Clearing the map and taking out Red early leaves me more resources and fewer chances of losing any units, making it more efficient to use both heroes to take fights, flag mines, and pick up resources. Using the Devils, I quickly take out some Grand Elves, Red Hero Vokial, and some Thunderbirds, getting access to a Hill Fort, which lets me upgrade my units at the same cost as in the town, but without the need to upgrade the creature dwelling, saving some resources. I upgrade Marius's Devils and Pyrus Afriti as well. I take out the first and second of Red's four towns, 
a ramper town in the north and a castle town in the middle of the map. High level units this early, upgraded as well, are just too overpowered if you ask me. The very next day I take advantage of Pyre's map mobility to take Red's second castle town as well. If you're wondering why I'm not discussing my skill choices on level ups, it's because I don't plan on using these heroes in the final scenario. The strategy I intend on using requires dungeon heroes, for a few reasons I can come back to in the next scenario. But I can say that having logistics on Pyre has made this map quite a bit easier to explore. Already on week 2 day 7, Red is vanquished. If you haven't figured it out already, the AI is an absolute joke in this scenario. The only possible challenge here is the green dragons guarding the gold dragon queen, and their numbers are variable, meaning that sometimes they are quite easy, and sometimes they pose a bit of a challenge. My objective now is just to gather up enough archdevils to be able to fight the green dragons. In previous attempts, 8 archdevils have been enough, so I basically stay in town, waiting until I've recruited all the 8 archdevils required. Green dragons, like red dragons, are immune to level 1 to 3 spells, so a level 4 or 5 damage spell would be helpful. But since I intend on using Marius for these fights, and Marius doesn't have wisdom, because I skipped it, I don't build up the magic guilds looking for good spells. Both guard fights are against a low number of green dragons. 5 in the first fight and 8 in the second fight. Previous attempts have had as high as 14 in both fights, so this is a fair bit easier. Because of their low numbers, I can just quick combat through the fights, making it a slight bit anticlimactic. Nevertheless, the final fight is against the Gold Dragon Queen. Using my tactical brilliance and combat intelligence, I maneuver deftly around the battlefield and just one-shot her. Not much of a challenge here so far, but the hard part is yet to come. A certain General Morgan Kendall is waiting in the final scenario. But before we get that far, we have to get through scenario number 2, Groundbreaking. This time, I don't have the option of continuing using the heroes from the previous scenario, like in Long Live the Queen. Playing as Dungeon, our hero classes are a bit different. Dungeon heroes are either Overlords, who are might based, or Warlocks, who are magic based. I soft reset a few times, looking for a good Warlock for a few reasons. One, my final scenario strategy is heavily magic based. 2. Warlocks have a higher chance of getting plus 1 to spell power instead of other stats on level ups, until level 9, making my spells more effective. And 3. Warlocks have a decent chance of getting earth magic, which will be extremely relevant in the final scenario, and a bunch of other secondary skills I want, like intelligence, sorcery and air magic. In the end, I get the Warlock Jedite, who is the best choice, because he starts off with the spell Resurrection and no useless other secondary skill, like Deemer with Scouting for example. I could always get this spell from a level 4 magic guild, but I'd rather not risk not getting it. I also get Gunner, an overlord with logistics as a specialty, from the tavern, which will help my map exploration abilities. The early scenario strategy is to build up to a dragon cave by the end of week 2. The bottleneck here is sulfur, and I don't have any sulfur mines available close to me, so instead I build up to a resource silo as early as possible, netting me plus one sulfur a day. This is also why I chose the Pillar of Ice as a scenario bonus, literally just to save one sulfur as it costs one of each resource. Using the red dragons I get by doing this, I can go to the overworld and start clearing out red towns. Like in the first scenario, Red starts off with four towns in practically the same overworld locations. One in the middle, and then one in the northwest corner, one in northeast, and one in southwest. Until then, I use the second best option, Manticores. The problem here, compared to the first scenario, is that a lot of the possible, and sometimes necessary, fights are against ranged units like Evil Eyes and Medusa Queens. These are instances where the spell power of a warlock is extremely good using magic arrows to whittle down the ranged units, waiting on my turn so I don't take full ranged damage, and then targeting the units in a way to spread out the damage on my one stack manticores. If I'm careless, the AI will focus them down one by one. Picking up the shield, Buckler of the Null King, which gives me plus 4 defense, makes future fights like these much safer as well. This Medusa Queen fight in particular is actually much more difficult than it looks. I start off by magic arrowing the middle Medusa Queen. 
Medusa Queen has 30 HP, so two magic arrows will be enough to kill the middle three unit stack. Since having a unit next to an opposing ranged unit stops them from shooting, the strategy is to keep one Manticore in the middle of the two top queens and one in the middle of the two bottom ones. The Manticore, which was targeted in round one, is not especially healthy, but neither will any of my other Manticores be if I don't juggle their targets around a bit. I purposefully don't attack with the third Manticore in order to take less retaliation damage. Every turn, I need to use Magic Arrow to slowly whittle down the Medusa Queens. Not attacking with the bottom Manticore pays off, and I get a little bit lucky, as it survives with just 3 HP. A little bit of positioning trickery, quite a bit of luck with not getting turned to stone, and I make it out of this fight alive. Probably the toughest fight in the first two campaigns, so far. The neutral dungeon towns I'm flagging are mostly just for gold and sulfur income, as well as giving me better trading ratios, which you will get by having more marketplaces built. I make sure to also flag different resource mines, as later in the scenario I will build up the magic guilds looking for a few different spells to make the last scenario possible, namely Meteor Shower, Chain Lightning, Implosion, Town Portal, Dimension Door and Fly. I don't expect to get all of these, but at least getting a couple of them would be extremely useful. I've mentioned the secondary skills I want, but why do I want them? With Earth Magic, should I get any of the Earth spells, Meteor Shower, Implosion and Town Portal, I get to cast them at a reduced cost, and in the case of the first two, increased damage as well. Having at least Advanced Earth also makes it so Resurrection fully revives units I cast it on, not just temporarily in combat. Advanced Earth also lets me choose which of my towns I get to Town Portal to, not just automatically portaling to the closest one. Air Magic reduces Chain Lightning's cost and also increases its damage. Expert Air Magic also lets me Dimension Door up to 4 times each turn, making me extremely mobile. Higher level Air Magic reduces Terrain Penalty when using Fly as well. Very useful. Intelligence increases my spell points, aka mana. This, combined with Mana Vortex, gives me a huge mana pool, making it possible for me to focus solely on getting plus spell power, therefore getting stronger spell casting. Sorcery increases my spell damage. Sorcery plus Earth Magic plus a lot of spell power plus an artifact in the last scenario guarantees me one-shotting a certain stack of units with a certain spell as well. Other skills which would be nice would be Armor and Logistics, but they're not necessary, just useful. Alright, enough talking, time for some action. It's week 3, day 1, and I have a whole 2 red dragons waiting in my main town. With Jedite, I take the 2 dragons, trade over the manticores to Gunner, which leaves his 1 harpy in the closest town, and it's time to assault the overworld. Like in the first scenario, red is not giving me much of a fight. Jedite takes care of the middle castle town, and heads for the northeast rampart town. Along the way there, I stop by the hill fort to upgrade to black dragons. Now. I'm unstoppable. I make sure to not flag the southwest tower town, for a good reason, which will be apparent later. After taking out Yuland, who was trying to take back the Rampart town, I check the tavern to see if Red has fewer heroes than I have, which they do, so I know they only have one hero, who even is visible to me. Hence, I can head straight for the northwestern castle town without risking losing any of the other towns I've flagged. Astral is the final real battle in this scenario and even managed to kill one black dragon in the quick combat, meaning I have to manually beat his butt. I suspect the griffins were the problem, so I lightning bolt to reduce their numbers a bit. Astral is silly enough to line up his units for dragon breath, so I, of course, take advantage of this. Moving out of his reach gives me another turn of free spellcasting. Lightning bolting the halberdiers leaves no more threats from Astral's units, and this fight is free from here on out. After reaching the castle town, Red has bought out every unit they can, but I can simply quick combat my way to victory. This leaves only the town Gunner is guarding. The AI refuses to build up this town, however, so I have as much time in the world to do what I want from here. Skipping ahead a bit, what I did was flagging as many mines I could, taking as many fights I could to level up Jedi to the scenario max of 12, and building up the magic guilds in my dungeon towns, one castle town, and the rampart town, looking for the spells I mentioned earlier. After visiting these towns, I simply flag the last remaining red town without a fight to secure the scenario victory. Alright, the real challenge begins. 
The objective of this scenario is to take Stedwick, a heavily guarded castle town in the middle of the map, guarded by General Kendall, who starts off with a lot of stats and a big army. I need to take the town within three months, but actually four, as you get four extra weeks during the scenario, meaning I cannot take my time to build up an infinitely big army, but I still need a big enough army to take on the general. This scenario, as you will notice by all my preparations, planning and explaining, is essentially a puzzle solving scenario. First, I make sure to choose the dungeon heroes from the second scenario. Now, let's take stock of what we have so far on Jedi, my main hero. Expert Wisdom, Expert Air, Expert Intelligence, Expert Sorcery, and just Basic Earth. This is not a bad skill tree at all, pretty much everything I asked for, but not having at least Advanced Earth is a bit of an inconvenience. I need Advanced Earth to be able to do a very important neutral fight. Spells wise, I have Fly as a mobility spell, but missing Town Portal and Dimension Door. As Town Portal is probably the best spell in the game, I need to get my hands on this as soon as possible. Of the damage spells I wanted, I have all of them. Overall, I'm in a great position. Now, how do I get Town Portal? Well, this scenario is actually quite forgiving in this regard, as in the bottom right corner of the underground, there is a random relic artifact. That means I can get the strongest stat boosting artifacts like Helm of Heavenly Enlightenment, Sword of Justice and Titan's Cuirass. Utility artifacts like Angel Wings, artifacts like Orb of Vulnerability that can make for some creative strategies I'm pretty sad I didn't get to use. And most importantly, Spell Tomes. They give me all the spells of a certain type. In this case, I need the Earth Tome so I get access to all Earth spells, including Town Portal. But it's guarded by several black dragons, so I can't just waltz in and grab it. As black dragons are immune to magic as well, I need a sizable army to take them on. So the early strategy is to amass a big enough army to kill the black dragons. In the same corner, there's also a red dragon dwelling, meaning I can flag this, build a summoning portal, and this, combined with castle and dragon cave in my dungeon town, I can get plus 5 red dragons every week. Getting all of this in week 1 is practically impossible, so the aim is to have all of this built and the red dragon dwelling flagged by the end of week 2. A bit of a challenge indeed. Due to my level and stat farming in the previous scenario, along with getting all the damage spells I wanted, I can use Jedi to take on a bunch of the nearby fights using only a harpy stack to get access to mines and resources. Chain lightning and meteor shower especially are really useful. I avoid taking fights against ranged units, as the Harpies are way too weak to tank multiple hits from any type of unit, so it's almost a guarantee to lose at least one Harpy in these fights. On day 5, however, I build a Manticore layer, trade the two Manticores over to Jedi, and this opens up the opportunity to take on pretty much every nearby fight, except the Black Dragons. Compared to the Medusa Queen fight in the last scenario, this fight is an absolute breeze. Stronger spellcasting is so, so, so good. Using magic arrows instead of meteor showers is just to save mana, by the way, so I don't have to return to town to replenish my mana too often. In the middle of week two, I start heading back to the dungeon town with Jedi and leave all the manticores on Gunner, so he can take fights in the overworld. On week two, day four, I build a dragon cave and get my first red dragon. Still not having advanced earth, I'm hopeful that the next level up nets me just that that I can take on the black dragons very soon. Taking the red dragon dwelling is easy with proper spell casting, but it's starting to get critical. I need advanced earth. I decide to take on the earth elementals slightly north of my dungeon town and cross my fingers. Yes, finally. Now, when I get the next batch of red dragons, I'll say hi to the black dragons. It takes me until week three, day three, to finally get the Jedi's butt down to the black dragons. But when I finally get there, they want to join me? In hindsight, it was probably a really stupid idea to decline this, as I could have traded them over to Gunner and taken a bunch of slightly more difficult fights with him. But what's done is done. The fight itself highlights what is going to be my late game strategy, resurrecting red dragons. If you have paid attention, I haven't once mentioned I will be getting black dragons, for this simple reason. They are immune to magic, and therefore they cannot be resurrected. This is why, if I had all the spells I needed for my wishlist from the previous scenario, the Orb of Vulnerability would have been so much fun. Since it renders all natural magic immunity useless, I could have resurrected Black Dragons instead. Such a waste of potential here. 
Now that I have Town Portal though, the map really opens up for me. I upgrade Gunner's Manticores to Scorpicores, so we can take more fights, and start exploring more with Jedites. Fairly close to me, there are two of Red's castle towns. The most important one is the one slightly northwest of me, as it is closer to Stedwick, and you usually have some curious heroes wanting to invade my territory, which the southwestern town does not. The castle town is guarded by a single imp, so no challenge there. The nice thing about castle towns is the ability to build the stables, which gives me more movement for visiting heroes the rest of the week. And that is always useful. Before I go on the last offensive, I have a few objectives in mind. First, the cartographer inside the closed off Stedwig zone. In order to get access to this, I either need to pass through a garrison, which has a large castle army defending it, or use fly to move over the terrain. Usually, I would like the experience from the garrison fight, but the garrisons surrounding the Stedwick zone are anti-magic zones, meaning it's practically impossible to not lose any units. Secondly, inside the zone is another random relic artifact as well, and depending on which one it is, I would love to get it. It is always guarded by Archangels, and for some reason, Red never tries to get this artifact. In this run, it's an Air Tome, which is just amazing, as it gives me the last spell for my wishlist, Dimension Door. The third and fourth mini objectives are a library in the southwest, which gives plus two to all stats on level 10 or higher heroes, and an Orb of Silt. This is the artifact which lets me one-shot General Kendall's champion stack with implosion, as it gives plus 50% earth spell damage. So good! In the meantime, I take out the heroes Hallen and Khalid, who both have notable armies, and then set my sights on the air tome. Without resurrection, the Archangel fight would be pretty much impossible to do without losses. With resurrection, one cast and some well-placed dragonfire makes this fight a breeze. The power of good spells is just incredible. I also make sure to take on the Griffin Conservatory, which sets me three angels. The plan is to trade them over to Gunner and let him take some fights to the north, collecting whatever useful resources and or artifacts he comes over. After taking the southwestern castle town, visiting the library and getting the Orb of Silt, I also decide to take the northwestern town. In previous runs, 23 red dragons have been enough to take on the general, so I have some time to kill, one week. So I figured I might as well take this town as well. But then something completely new happens. Red has traded all their marksmen over to someone other than General Kendall. This has literally never happened before to me. Of course, I take advantage of this, as it would make the final fight much easier. A couple of well-placed spell casts, and the marksmen are history. Will this be the easiest run yet? Now, it's just a waiting game until I have all the red dragons I need. With my 23 dragons, I stand just outside Stedwick's gates, waiting to be attacked as my army should be small enough for the AI to just attack me. But the general never comes out. This also never happens. Is it the lack of marksmen that keeps him inside the gates? I decide to attack him in Stedwick, just to show off why I want to be attacked. I get to show off why Implosion is so good as well, one-shotting the champions. But I also show off the problem with sieging, the catapult. It always gets destroyed in this fight. And as it is a war machine, counting as a unit, I can't be on the offensive air. I need to fight outside the town. So I reload deciding to get more red dragons. But then I see it. General Kendall left the town? This opens up an opportunity. I can just dimension door over to the barely guarded town, flagging it. It is a bit cheesy, but it gets the job done. However, this is not what I'm about, if I can help it. So while I did manage to do this without unit losses, I want that final fight. I reload all the way back to before I take out Christian with all the marksmen hoping this would make the AI think it's strong enough to attack me outside the town. Which works, but this doesn't mean the fight is straightforward. I need a specific battlefield layout. The layout changes depending on which tile I stand on, so I move around outside Stedwick looking for the perfect one. In the end, it turns out the perfect tile is the one next to the windmill, and I get to be the attacker. So what is the point of this battlefield layout, you ask? Well. At the bottom, there is a puddle of water which narrows the walking path to just one hex. If I place my dragons there, I can only be melee attacked by two units at once, instead of at least three if I place the dragons in a corner. If the dragons were one hex units, I could place them in the right corners for the same effect, but this is not the case. After taking out the zealots with implosion, as they are ranged, 
What I need to do now is whittle down the slowest of the two units attacking me. Griffins in this case. If I try to keep the champion stack low, I would kill them with my dragons with retaliation, as they attack before the griffins. Since I will never retaliate against the griffins as long as the champions are alive, I take less damage per turn, making it possible to resurrect more dragons than I lose. With this perfect scenario created, I take out the crusaders with another well-placed implosion, as the crusaders do a ton of damage. Now, there are no threats left. His unit count is now more than low enough for my dragons to survive several hits in a row, allowing me to resurrect way more dragons than I lose. Since both his other units are trapped by the ballista, meaning they can't walk around and behind my dragons, I can finally take out the griffins and then the champions. Resurrect, attack, resurrect, attack. General Kendall tries desperately blessing his cavaliers to at least kill some dragons. But I have pretty much infinite mana with the Intelligence plus Mana Vortex combo. I'll never run out of Resurrects in this fight. Poor guy has no chance now. I finally move forward to hit his forever passive Naga Queens. I felt bad for them. They had to get involved at some point too. Shame that such a strong unit had such little impact. Good for me though. To rub salt in the wound, I even take out his Ballista. One final Resurrect and BOOM! The general is down. I repeat, the general is down. And just for the fun of it, I make a fool out of Christian again. One final siege against the hero-less Stedwick. Now I feel like a deserved conqueror of this campaign. Taking Stedwick in two different ways without losing any units. While I don't love using resurrection strategies, I'm not sure how I would do this without them. What I can say is that the next campaign in Restoration of Arathia most likely does not include Resurrection, unless I get really creative. Who knows? Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do leave a like or a comment. I appreciate it more than you know. Have a great day. Welcome to Heroes of Might and Magic 3, no unit loss. Spoils of War is an interesting campaign. It's not set up to have a large final fight or an epic climactic end, but the final scenario is still a puzzle solving exercise with a bit of randomness sprinkled on top of it, making it a tough one to figure out in a challenge like this. Now, with that out of the way, scenario number one, Borderlands. The objective is to flag all mines on the map. I play as Fortress, the defense focused faction. I face off against the embarrassingly weak red, who are unable to build up their towns, basically at all. So since they are of no threat, I have to create my own mini objectives. Get all permanent stats in the scenario possible. Get to level 12 on my main hero, the scenario maximum. And get all level 1 and 2 magic spells. The last one may sound a little bit odd. Why don't I go for level 4 or 5 spells like in the previous campaigns? Because Fortress can only build up the mage guild level 3 and the castle towns are locked to a maximum of mage guild level 2. Same thing in the next scenarios as well, with the exception of one single castle town in the final scenario. This means I need to have a might based approach. Luckily, fortress have good might heroes, beastmasters. The obvious choices are Tazar, Broghild and Alkin. Tazar because of his armor specialty, Broghild because of his wyvern specialty, and Alkin because he starts with both offense and armor. Both good might secondary skills. As you can already tell, I went with Alkin. But why? Initially, I planned on solving a neutral fight problem in the last scenario with Brogil's plus 1 to Wyvern speed and a plus 1 speed artifact. But in the end, the Wyverns are just too squishy, and scouting isn't necessary when I know the map layouts. Tazar faces a really annoying and counterintuitive bug that made him less consistent compared to Alkin, which I will showcase later. So Alkin is the man. The strategy for this scenario is really straightforward. Get Hydras. We get all the resources needed to build a Hydra Pond in week 1, so this is no issue. Having just 2 Hydras in week 2 lets me steamroll red, all the mine guards, and power level to level 12. It really is that simple, especially as the Hydras have no enemy retaliation. But I reset this first scenario off screen a bunch of times because I really wanted logistics on Alkin. I also needed earth magic, so I could mass slow in case I needed it in the final scenario. Slow is extremely powerful, especially for a tier 1 spell. 
Expert Earth also lets me cast Mass Shield and Stone Skin, should I need the extra defense. The permanent stats available in this scenario are plus one attack, plus one defense, and plus three power. Building up Cage of Warlords in my fortress towns give me an additional plus two defense as well. Everything but one of the plus one power are easy to reach, but that final plus one power is hidden behind mighty gorgons. After taking care of red and flagging all but the final gold mine, I build up the mage guilds to level 2, level Alkin to 12 and collect every stat up except the mighty gorgon one. My side hero, Merist, has no real use for me, but he will make himself useful again in the final scenario. Because of the mighty gorgon's death stare ability, this fight can actually be quite devastating. Upgrading to Chaos Hydras lets me outspeed, 7 versus 6 speed, and makes the fight much safer in every regard. However, the Gorgons just end up wanting to join me. I decline the offer, collect the plus one power, and flag the final mine. We'll take stock of how Alkin is looking in the final scenario. Job well done so far. Before we get into scenario number two, I have a couple of questions for you in regards to the rules. What do you feel about using, and probably losing, clones? While I do have units lost at the end of combat screen this way, I don't actually lose any quote unquote real units. And what about surrendering? No units are lost this way either, so it technically doesn't break any rules I think. Both feel a little bit cheesy, but I'm curious about your thoughts. I don't plan to use either strategy as of now, but it could be fun to mix up my approach from time to time. And you never know, it might come in handy sometime. So, Gold Rush. It's quite a different type of scenario. The objective is to collect 200,000 gold by any means necessary. I even have a trading post in my area to trade resources for gold should I need it. As tier 7 units are quite overpowered, the easy choice of scenario bonus is the Ancient Behemoth, as it easily lets me handle the few mine guards on this map. My strategy here is literally just to build up to a capital in one town and a city hall in the second town. Additionally, there are quite a lot of different mines throughout my biome, most of which are unguarded, which I will of course flag. I recruit the third hero, Deemer in this case, to flag most of the southern mines to allow Zubin, who starts with the Behemoth, to focus on clearing the only local mine guard, which is easily handled by the auto combat. I don't build up any creature dwellings as it costs golden resources and I will try to avoid fights if at all possible. To be perfectly honest, this scenario is very uninteresting to me. The AI is not very interactive and there are basically no fights at all. Still, I send Zubin to explore outside my biome. Going through the underground, he ends up in an area containing a red castle town. Again, using the ancient behemoth, Red's hero is easily disposed of. Recruiting a fourth hero, Tyraxor, is just to flag the mines so Zubin can continue his exploration mission. On week 3, day 2, I encounter the first potential threat. I say potential because in all my playthroughs of this scenario, I have yet to be actually attacked. I'm not about to find out if Red will actually attack in this case, so I still run off, but I suspect the threshold of aggression for Red is just extremely high. Some more resource collecting later, and I send Shiva over to the trading post to trade my massive amounts of resources for gold. I probably could have finished this a day earlier, but this is not a speedrun, so it doesn't really matter. With over 220,000 gold, I finished this scenario on week 3, day 6. We are already on to the final scenario. The final scenario of this campaign, Greed, lets me choose between the fortress heroes of the first scenario and the stronghold heroes of the second one. Since I spent a lot of time building Alkin as a main, I will of course choose the fortress heroes. So let's take a look at Alkin. He's gotten up to expert armor, expert offense, expert earth magic, expert logistics, and basic wisdom. Wisdom is useless for me in this campaign, but all the other skills are very useful. Earth magic lets me use expert slow, which is always extremely good. Expert logistics, combined with the available stables in the biome, gives me superb map mobility, and armor and offense are both excellent in fights when I'm forced to be might based. His stats are reasonable. 4 attack, 12 defense, 5 power, but a measly 2 knowledge. I really could have used more knowledge, but I guess Alkin is just a big dum dum. Overall, I'm very satisfied. The objective of this scenario is just to defeat all enemies and capture all towns. 
We face off against Red, a castle faction located in the middle of the map who basically cannot build up their towns, and Purple, a stronghold faction on the opposite side of the map who can definitely build up their towns, making them much more threatening than Red. So what is the overarching strategy? As mentioned, the battle strategy is might based. This means no AoE spells or no resurrection. To make fights as safe and consistent as possible, I need to use high level units. Fortress has quick access to tier 6 units in Wyverns, so they will be my weak 1 units of choice. However, the long term unit will be the tier 7 Chaos Hydras, as they are very tanky, have AoE attacks and no enemy retaliation. They are slow however, so getting fight initiative and reaching ranged units can be a bit tricky. They also move on ground, meaning sieging enemy towns can be challenging if they hide inside their walls, especially with the consistent arrow tower damage. Luckily, I have a trick or two up my sleeve. I start with three towns. There is the possibility of triple building hydras, but due to two of the towns not having fort or any creature dwellings built, this is just too expensive. I aim to have a hydro pond built in my main town on day 7, and to start building up a second town in week 2, hopefully having a second hydro pond in week 3. To achieve this, I need a large amount of wood, a bunch of ore, a chunk of sulfur, and a fair bit of gold. To have enough wood income, I build up resource silos in my two lesser towns as early as possible, as well as getting city halls in both of them for gold income as well. The easternmost town will be the second hydro pond town, for the simple reason of there being a library close by. Since I don't have access to high level magic, my approach to the map has to be non-magic based as well. This means no town portal, no dimension door, and no fly. Everything is on foot, or horse in this case. I mentioned some randomness in the introduction of this video. If you paid close attention, you may have noticed the monolith one-way exit next to the sulfur mine. Sometimes a red hero, almost always Tyrus, comes through this and scares the bejesus out of my side heroes. I have reset a few times in the past because of her taking my mostly null defended main town, which is quite annoying having to do. I'd rather not have to park a hero with a sizable army close to the monolith exit since I value exploration over the safety it would bring. A bit annoyingly, the southern witch hut teaches logistics, meaning all my resetting the first scenario looking for this was kind of wasted. But oh well. Funnily enough, I find Broghild in the tavern in week 2. Since I plan on having Alkin use Hydras only, I recruit Broghild to use Wyverns and take advantage of his Wyvern specialty. Neat and useful. I don't have to use Marist, thankfully. After flagging all the mines and collecting all the permanent stats and artifacts in the biome, I begin preparing for the first real hurdle of this scenario, the Border Garrison. This garrison has 120 Hobgoblins, 70 Wolf Raiders, 50 Orc Chieftains, 30 Augur Magi, and 15 Thunderbirds. The two issues here are the Orc Chieftains, as they are ranged, and the Thunderbirds, as they are faster than my Chaos Hydras. So how can I overcome this? First and foremost, I need more Hydras. In week 3, I finish building up both a castle and a Hydra Pond in the second town, meaning I have 4 available Hydras to recruit every week. These, combined with the Hydras I had accumulated previously, Let's be a total of 9 Hydras in week 4. Upgrading them to Chaos Hydras gives me a good chance to do the garrison fights. Now, I could just wait until I had a million Hydras and just smash the garrison. But doing this lets my enemies build up their forces too much, making getting a no unit loss a slim possibility. So 9 Hydras it is. On week 4, day 2, I upgrade 6 of my Hydras to Chaos Hydras, and after recruiting the remaining 3 the next day, I'm ready to go. Ironically, even the quick combat manages to do this fight without losses, which was a huge surprise for me. Apparently, I overprepared. I let the fight play out just to see how the computer did it, and there really was no difficulty to it. My intended strategy was to blind the orcs to force the opponents forward and then take advantage of the Chaos Hydra's AoE no retaliation attacks, but the AI just huddled up anyway. Maybe I can use the blind strategy later? Hmm. After visiting the library, getting a plus 2 to my stats, there is a power artifact guarded by Hydras close by. These Hydras can actually join you, especially if your army is Hydras or Chaos Hydras only. This time I get lucky and they join me, 
netting me an additional 9 Hydras. My position is looking extremely good at the moment. Brogil will accompany Alkin in exploring outside my biome, so I upgrade his Wyverns to Wyvern Monarchs to help him out. Brogil needs to avoid taking difficult hero fights, as Wyvern Monarchs are just too squishy, and Brogil is too low leveled and too low statted. Doesn't mean he can't take neutral fights though. After upgrading the 9 additional Hydras, Alkin's mission is to go after purple, as they are way more threatening than red. Before Alkin gets that far, however, Brogil finds a practically unguarded red town and takes it. Doing this is just to have some sort of control of where red should go, as they will probably try to take the town back, not getting tempted to go through the monolith one way into my biome. This is a town I suspect I will lose while I take on purple, that's no big deal to me. Before being able to take on purple, I need to go through another border garrison, this time with fortress units. 120 Null Marauders, 70 Lizardmen Warriors, 50 Dragonflies, 30 Greater Basilisks, and 15 Mighty Gorgons. Quick Combat did not manage to do this without losses. Immediately, the Dragonflies go on the offensive, which surprised me a little bit. I use my intended blind strategy by blinding the Lizardmen to force the AI forwards. I can then position my Hydras to hit multiple stacks of enemies. The Dragonflies get another cast of weakness off, but pay for that with their lives. I'm free to hit the Lizardmen without any real risk, and they just get absolutely obliterated. I've temporarily blocked myself from reaching the Gorgons the next turn, so I run away to force them to me. I then hit the Gorgons with both my Hydra stacks, and can move into Purple's territory, picking up the Stables boost along the way. First purple town is not built up in a meaningful way, which I can tell from the fortification icon. So this is a piece of cake, even for quick combat. The next town on the list is the one which has a pre-built fort, which means it is most likely well built up. However, in previous attempts, purple has had most of their forces in the third town, so it might be easy to take the middle town. Rog Hill, meanwhile, gets a peek at red's main town and GTFOs as quickly as possible. Not winning that one without losses. Gotta wait for our main man, Alkin, for that one. Unfortunately for me, Purple is defending their middle base, which has a castle built up and therefore three arrow towers, dealing nearly half my Hydra's HP at the start of each round. This could get tricky. I blind their biggest range stack and take out the rocks and wolf riders coming out to greet me. It lets me invade their space with the top stack, which is good news. Cure heals a bunch of HP and makes this a breeze from here on. A quintuple bite kills the imps and the gogs. Then the AI gives me a path to their orcs by sending the goblins into the Hydra meat grinder. Surviving with a massive 3 HP after turn 3 arrow tower damage, I have never felt more comfortable. The orcs are sitting ducks at the end, and purple's main starting town is mine. On to the last one. Reaching purple's last town only 2 days later, I intend on using the same strategy, blind the orcs and let them come to me. Before we get that far, however, I did say I would showcase why I don't use Tazar in this scenario. This fight is from a different playthrough, in which I have expert armor and 25 defense on both Alkin and Tazar, just to eliminate any potential variables. I enter the fight with 23 Chaos Hydras, and we can see they are hit down to 131 HP. Reloading and trading the Hydras over to Tazar, we enter the fight on the same day, same army amount, same enemy hero, etc. Now, my Hydras are hit down to 112 HP. That's quite a bit more. This difference in damage taken makes this fight quite a bit more complicated to solve. Not impossible, mind you, but more problematic. The bug is related to armor. Heroes with armor take their bonus defense as extra damage taken from arrow towers. For instance, Expert Armor gives 15% damage reduction usually. With Arrow Towers, Expert Armors gets to 15% extra damage taken instead. Tazar's Armor specialty makes his armor more effective in regular fights, but way worse in siege fights, which this scenario has quite a few of. Hence why Alkin is the superior option in my opinion. Having this in mind, I enter the fight with a blind strategy ready to use. Purple's hero, Zyron, sends out the Wolf Riders and Goblins which leave the gate open for my Hydras. However, this time, the Arrow Towers focus the same Hydra stack twice. This means I have no room to take another round of damage from them. Q 
Cure only heals up to 98 HP, as I don't have water magic or massive amounts of power. I take out the goblins to give myself free passage to the blinded orcs, but then I get taken down to 58 HP after rocks come out to get a hit in. So how do I solve this? Well, the arrow towers have a priority hierarchy which it follows. In short terms, and it's more complicated than this, they prioritize targets which can hit their friendly units the same turn, then units which can hit the following turn, and lowest on the list are units which can hit in two turns. Moving my low HP Hydras sufficiently backwards should, hopefully, make the arrow towers focus the other stack. The imps sacrifice themselves before the hour of truth is upon us. And thankfully, the arrow towers focus the healthy Hydras. Sometimes the weight of my brain is just too difficult to carry around efficiently. Taking out the orcs, and all of Purple's towns are mine. The weight of my brain has also made me forget to equip the powerful chest artifact, which would have made Cure more effective. But we can't all be perfect all the time, can we? A sneaky purple hero heads for the unguarded northern stronghold town and gets hold of it. But it's easily taken back by Alkin, and purple are officially vanquished, leaving only the, hopefully still, weak red. On the way to red's towns, Brogil has now accumulated 36 Wyvern Monarchs, and sets his sights on the best stat-boosting artifact in the game, Helm of Heavenly Enlightenment, guarded by a pack of behemoths, even sporting some ancient ones in the mix. A bless cast and strategic way turns, and this fight is easy peasy. Trading this amazing artifact over to Alkin sets him up to absolutely eradicate all traces of Red's existence. Broghill, meanwhile, is allowed to participate a little bit by taking the mostly unguarded eastern town. Quick combat makes quick work of Red's main town and their last castle town as well. They could potentially have taken a fortress town located in the south, but if they have, I will cross that bridge when I get there. Their main hero, Sorsha, is hiding close by, so my extremely overpowered Alkin heads straight for her for an epic final showdown. And quick combat just smacks her around. Only Tyre is left now, and she is hiding close to the southeastern border garrison. Alkin catches up to her, and she has some sort of army. Instead of quick combating, I let the in-fight auto-combat finish the job. The difference in stats is just too massive to overcome for her. This scenario would probably have been much more challenging had the 9 neutral Hydras not joined me after breaking through the first border garrison. However, I take advantage of everything I can, so it is what it is. With that, the first three Restoration of Arathia campaigns are finished. Let's see how the story continues. I suspect a quite familiar map will be present in the next campaign I take on. Stay tuned! If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like or a comment. It is appreciated much more than you know. Have a wonderful day or night or morning or whatever. Peace out. Welcome to Heroes of Might and Magic 3, no unit loss. Last time, I asked about your thoughts on using clones in combat and surrendering as well. My initial thoughts were that if I am to use clones, they need to survive the fight to not break any rules, and I think I will stick to that. I'll include this in the quote unquote official rules. Clones can be used, but need to survive combat. When it comes to surrendering, there were a lot of good takes, I think. The most logical argument presented is the one that essentially is. If it allows me to finish the challenge and it doesn't lose units, I should be able to do it. I like this, but I'm not going to abuse surrender strategies if I can avoid it. So I will allow surrendering, but restrict the usage as much as I can. I have no need for now to use either strategy, so this is not why I brought it up. It is mostly future-proofing this series, and it's nice to be able to mix up my approach from time to time. From now on, I'll include the rules in the description to save time in the intro, even if this one got a little bit too long. Now, Liberation, the fourth of seven campaigns in Restoration of Arathia. In the first scenario, Stedwick's Liberation, we have the scenario bonus choice of 10k in gold, 2 Archangels or 2 Titans. Both the Archangels and the Titans are good choices, but in my opinion, Archangels are just straight up the better units, so it's the natural choice. This campaign is set up differently than the previous ones. Here, you will not use your starting scenario heroes in the later scenarios. Instead, you can transfer some quest artifacts from scenario to scenario, getting a huge payoff in the final scenario. Unfortunately, this is bugged in scenario 3 out of 4, at least, so I don't really bother with it. Which is a shame, because I think it's a cool gimmick I would like to take advantage of. 
This encourages me to use some lesser used heroes, instead of super powering the usual big guns. So I reset a bunch until I get Aeris, the druid from Rampart, for no other particular reason than I rarely use druids. Using the two archangels, I immediately start exploring to the east, towards the scenario goal. All neutral fights in the first week are very straightforward with the archangels, but I figured I could use auto combat to show a few of the fights. I start off with the castle town and the tower town. We are up against Tan, who start with 7 towns, 3 castle, 3 dungeon and 1 inferno. The goal is to take Stedwick back, the castle town we conquered in the Dungeons and Devils campaign. The map is very similar to the final map of that campaign, with two castle towns and the inferno town in the east overworld. Aeris' early game goal is to take all these three towns in order to limit Tan's ability to pressure my main town. Infrastructure wise, I intend on building up to a portal of glory in the first week. If you know this map, you know we start off with an almost inaccessible angel dwelling in the water north of our starting castle town. This gives plus one angel growth every week as long as I have a portal of glory built, so it's very useful to get that early. Aeris' first target is the westernmost Tan Town, a castle town. This is usually not guarded by a hero this early, so it should be fairly low risk to go for. After taking this town, there is an inferno town directly to the east, which is often guarded by a hero. Tan almost all the time buys a hero in this town to start exploring, so it would make sense to go for this one first, right? Well, yeah, but it would make my pathing in the overworld inefficient as the other castle town is in the southeast, so I go for the western castle town first. There is one thing which is very time and stress saving in this scenario which I would like to go for, town portal. Town portal can be obtained through magic guild level 4, which can be built in every town in this scenario, or I could just get it from an earth tome. Where can I get an earth tome you ask? Well, if you again remember this map from the Dungeons and Devils campaign, there's a random relic artifact in the bottom right corner of the underground. Obviously, this could then be an earth tome, but it could also be other useful artifacts. If it happens to be any other good artifact, I will build up as many magic guilds as it takes to get town portal, but I'd rather just get it from the earth tome, as that would also give me the additional safety of having the resurrection spell. This also means I would need earth magic, which Ares already has learned. On day 7, I build the portal of glory. This will give me access to 3 angels on week 2 day 1, which lets me use the side heroes to flag all the mines in the starting zone. The inferno town is unguarded when I arrive at its gates on week 2 day 2, which likely means there's a tan hero running around somewhere. At least taking their town means they likely won't try to go for my main castle town, as they will be preoccupied by taking their inferno town back instead, which is good for me. Cuthbert shows up to take back the inferno town but I instead set my sights on the southeast castle town. As the tan castle town is unguarded, I simply walk in to claim it. Then I move back up to teach Cuthbert a lesson. Poor fellow looks like he's seen a ghost, but it was rather the divinity of the archangels. He surely is a believer now. Now all I gotta do is flag the inferno town again. Like I said, flag the inferno town. I actually forgot to do that. Not that it matters all that much, but damn do I feel silly now. Before attacking Cuthbert, I upgraded the Portal of Glory, which gives me access to Archangels from my starting castle town. Rissan's new task is to bring them to Aeris, so he can start attacking the underground, where the dungeon towns are located. The subterranean gate is guarded by black dragons. They start off as 4 in week 1, and I have experimented with going for them with just the two Archangels, but I couldn't find a way to do it consistently, so we need more Angel backup. Taking the relatively unguarded dungeon town, the hour of truth is upon us. What is in the southeastern corner? And would you believe it? It is in fact an earth dome. This makes my life so much easier. Having town portal this early lets me do a whole bunch of things. I can easily recruit archangels without the need of hero chains. I can build portals of summoning to recruit additional angels from the dungeon towns. And I can easily defend any town that is threatened. This feels good. In week 4, I have an incredible 13 Archangels in my army. Now, with Intelligence and the Mana Vortex, I have both the army and the mana available to go for the other two dungeon towns. Dungeon town number 2 is barely guarded, so it's quick combated. I build a portal of summoning to get another angel, and I get 16 gremlins? Yeah, right next to my starting tower town, there's a pre-flagged gremlin dwelling. Probably to balance things a little bit here, I hope. Darn you 3DO. 
Last dungeon town is also easy pickings. Another portal of summoning produces another angel. The next objective now is the hardest fight in this scenario, the garrison. After collecting all available archangels the next week, I feel ready to go for it. The garrison fight is against a massive 10 black dragons, 20 plus 20 scorpicors, 30 plus 30 minotaur kings, and 40 plus 40 evil eyes. Let's go for it. I'll try to avoid casting the spell resurrection if I can. Turn 1, I cast Expert Slow. This allows me to kite all units but the black dragons. I prioritize taking out the dragons, which would allow me to take fewer hits in the future. Turn 2, I cast Expert Stone Skin. I figure this is better than Expert Shield, as Stone Skin also lowers range damage. Already, I have lost one Archangel in each stack. Archangels can cast Resurrection with a flat power of 100 HP per Archangels, so I can't let my stacks get hit too low, or I won't be able to rest them back using their abilities. Turn 3, I go for the Evil Eyes, as they are the only ranged units. I also cast Shield, as I will start taking pure melee damage from now on. As I only have 5 power, my Meteor Shower cast is extremely weak, but all damage helps. Hiding in the corner, I'm only hit by one stack of Scorpicors after waiting. I take some damage from the Scorpicors, but as long as I'm never hit by too many stacks, unless the stacks are small, I should be in little danger. Next turn, I need to recast slow, before I hide in the opposite corner. After using the wait strategy, the Scorpicor stack reaches my Archangels and paralyzes them. This is healed by Cure, thankfully, so I'm still in good shape. Kiting from corner to corner, Taking advantage of wait turns to focus down one stack at a time, I reach a point where I'm safe to cast my Archangel's Resurrection ability without risking losing any more of them. After this, I simply finish off the remaining stacks. I'm quite satisfied with this fight actually, as I didn't have to use my spell Resurrection and only used the Archangel's Resurrection ability instead. This only leaves Steadwick. Time to liberate. There probably should be a more powerful hero defending this town, but as they are never more of a challenge than the garrison this early in the scenario, I don't bother go looking for them. My army is miles ahead of poor Tamika's army. Easy finish. Job reasonably well done. A few things I obviously could have done better, but if it works, it works. Ares isn't following me in the later scenarios anyway, so I don't mind not optimizing this like I would have done if I were to use him throughout the campaign. Alright, scenario number two. Deal with the devil. The scenario bonus doesn't matter at all, so we just go with Ice Bolt. On to the gameplay. I reset a bunch here as well, in order to get the god of gods, Yulun, the cure specialist. Why Yulun, you ask? Because the final fight has to be done on cursed ground, which doesn't allow magic above level 1, so I want a strong level 1 spell. Cure in this case. The goal of this scenario is to conquer the inferno town of Cleesiv which is guarded by the clan leader, who is just Axis in disguise. To reach this town, I have to get by the Archdevil guards. Fairly straightforward. The early game strategy is to build up to a portal of glory in week 1. Again, this will be a recurring theme in this campaign. Using the angels I get from this, I will clear my entire starting zone to have enough income to eventually upgrade to Archangels, so I can advance towards Cleesip. The main obstacle in this scenario is to avoid the strongest Tan hero. Tan starts with 5 towns, 4 of which are fairly easily connected. This makes it so Tan always has a hero with a large amount of imps, gogs, hellhounds and demons, sometimes pit fiends as well. While this is definitely not impossible to overcome for Yulin, Tan usually starts invading my rampart zone at the end of week 3 or the beginning of week 4, which means my scouting hero up there will certainly die. So there is a soft time limit present for me here. In week 2, I begin building up my second castle town. The goal is to have a regular portal of glory, an upgraded portal of glory, and castle built up in both towns in week 4, but I'm fairly resource strapped. By no means am I poor, but double building archangels is really expensive. Thankfully, there is a trading post in my starting zone, so I can always do some wheeling and dealing to get what I need. In week 3, I get the first glimpse of Tan's hero, Cal, who is pretty strong already. If I can, I should avoid him. He's a Gog specialist, so him having Horde of Gogs already is quite intimidating. With my 5 angels, I start exploring outside my biome. I take one town and flag a gold mine before I head back. Week 4 is when I plan on making the final advance, so I try to be fairly efficient with my movements. Nothing exceptional, 
I'm no PvP pro, but I don't feel like wasting too much time. Week 4, day 1, Tan has invaded my Rampart zone. Time is of the essence now. I need to make the push towards Cleesiv. So I hide Serena as far away as I can and hope she's not seen. And on week 4, day 4, I have upgraded all my angels to archangels and it's time to go on the offensive. The arch devils are no match for Yulin and I can just march into Cleesiv's surroundings. For whatever reason, the clan leader almost always attacks me when I'm stood outside Cleesiv like this. Personally, I think I'm much stronger than he is, but he still goes for it for whatever reason. You might think this is the easiest fight ever. Just use the Archangel Resurrection ability if things go wrong, right? Wrong. Cursed Ground means they can't cast their Resurrection ability either, which is why I want Cure as a safety measure. Turn 1, I just wait with both my stacks as none of Tan's units can reach mine. They surround the Gogs to defend them, and since I can't one-shot either the Ifriti or the Pitfins, I'm guaranteed to take some damage. I take out the two Devils with one Archangel stack, and get a big hit on the Ifriti with the other. Turn 2, I completely waste a turn of magic by magic arrowing the Pitfins, but it's no huge deal. I hit the Pitfin stack down to 1 and reduce the Demon's numbers as well. Both my Archangels are still really healthy. Seems I didn't need Cure at all. Eliminating the Afriti gives me free passage to the somewhat big Gog stack, which is one shot by my Archangels. After this, the clan leader flees after casting a final magic arrow. My path is now free to the imp guarded Cleesive town, and I'm happy with the job well done. At least we got to see Yulin in action, which is nice. He's not exactly most people's first choice of hero, I think, but we are inclusive people here at Ollis HQ. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, and we're on to the next one. Alright, neutral affairs. Scenario bonus choices are fairly good. Both artifacts have upgrades in my starting area, so logistics it is. If I were to use any of the possible starting heroes, logistics would be so 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 good. But I'm gonna reset until I find a hero with pathfinding in the tavern, so it's not amazing. It still makes my side hero more mobile though. We are up against blue and purple. The goal of this scenario is to defeat all enemies and take all their towns. Blue starts off with two fortress towns and a castle town, while purple starts off with two stronghold towns and a castle town. The castle towns are never noticeably built up whenever I play this scenario, but the other towns can definitely be built up and fortified, so it is to my advantage to finish this off as quickly as possible. The map has purple in the southeast area, while blue is west-northwest. My starting zone is grassland, while pretty much the rest of the map is swamp terrain. Swamp terrain is why I want pathfinding. Only three heroes start off with this, Korbak, Clancy and Gretchen. Korbak would be my preferred choice as he starts off with Serpent Flies, and the Serpent Flies high speed would make me more map mobile, but this time I get Gretchen. Fair enough, she'll have to do. I start off with a tower town and two castle towns without forts built. This means I go for titans right? Well, no. The build path to the Cloud Temple is so resource heavy, and the upgraded Cloud Temple is so gem expensive, I don't think it's worth it. Building a Portal of Glory, even when a fort is not pre-built, is still the better option if you ask me. My week 1 strategy is to get some economy going, and then build a Portal of Glory in week 2. So I spend the first few days strolling around, collecting whatever resources I can get my hands on without taking any fights. Pretty much all fights in my starting area are against swordsmen or crusaders, who are basically impossible to do with just a basic starting army. However, there is an opportunity to get some good units from the four refugee camps in my biome. In previous attempts, the best I've gotten is a red dragon, which made every single fight in my biome possible to do with just the one dragon. On day 6, I check the final refugee camp, and I'm kicking myself for not checking this earlier. A titan. That's so lucky. I was considering not buying it, thinking it would devalue the challenge, but screw that, I want to use the titan. This means I can speed up my strategy by a whole lot. Trading the titan from Sorsha to Gretchen, it's time to lay waste to every man with the sword I can get my hands on. Sulfur guard? Easy. I let auto combat show just how OP the titan really is against his fools. Dude is just tanking every hit like it's nothing. Just a measly 110 out of 300 HP lost. Mercury Guard? Dead. A group of crusaders guarding an inexhaustible cart of lumber? Not on my watch, mate. I'll take that black shard of the dead knight as well, thank you very much. 
Gretchen is just speedrunning this starting zone at the moment. The first real obstacle in this scenario is, like in the first scenario, the garrison. This time, it's not as loaded with amazing units, but it can still be quite the challenge. 60 Null Marauders, 30 Lizardmen Warriors, and the beasts themselves. 15 mighty Gorgons. The Gorgons are why this isn't just a cakewalk. The Death Stare ability is a surefire way of losing units, so I want either enough angels to one-shot that stack, or good enough spells to kill them that way. The fight is on swamp terrain as well, giving all their units plus one speed, so kiting them is very difficult. I build the first portal of glory on week 2 day 4, and castle the day after. Now I'll start building up castle town number 2. I aim to have a portal of glory in castle number 2 in week 3, and possibly upgrading to archangels soon after. The titan lets me be a little bit more flexible in my approach though, so on week 3 day 1 I go for the garrison fight. As you can see, auto combat got absolutely smacked around here. Mighty Gorgons are no joke. Turn 1, I cast slow on the Gorgons and wait with both my units. Since my power is only 2, slow will only last 2 turns, so I need to recast this a few times. 58 Nulls died to my 3 Angels, but as the Lizardmen got a morale on the first turn, my Angels aren't as healthy as I would like them to be. Turn 2, I just smack the Lizardmen with my Angels leaving 8 of them alive. Every titan attack will go straight into the beefy boys, to tenderize them for the eventual angel hit. Turn 3, I need to run away from the mighty cows, but the titan still gives the horned trucks a taste of thunder whenever he can. After taking out the lizardmen with my angels, I need to kite the gorgons around. Even with slow, this isn't as easy as it looks. If I had expert slow, this would have been simple, but basic slow is very weak compared to the expert variants. After running out of mana, I eventually just have to take the risk of taking the hit. If it doesn't work, then I learn my lesson. But luckily, I managed to survive the two hits I took from the angry oxen, and I'm free to explore enemy territory. Not gonna pretend this was particularly smart or well played, but it definitely worked. Somehow. I take some time to level Gretchen up to level 10, so I can get a plus 2 in all stats from the nearby library. After this, I start conquering. Purple first. Their castle town has no hero guarding it, and only a rudimentary army, so I just quick combat it. I get another meeting with the annoying cows, guarding the entrance to Purple's main towns, but only a group of 5 this time among its unupgraded peers. You can see how scared I am of those milky moo-moos. With my improved stats, they are thankfully easily taken care of, and the angels eliminate the rest of the stacks. Phew. Stronghold town number 1 is guarded by a measly 7 orcs so I just quick combat this one as well. The final stronghold town is decently guarded, by AI week 3 standards at least. Sanya is just evaporated, while Caitlyn, who is guarding the actual town, is not handled by the quick combat. I severely outstat her, but I still need to be wary of the rocks and the shooters. Turn 1, I do the usual waiting strategy. Incredibly enough, my titan and angel damage in combination does exactly one more damage than necessary to kill the full rock stack. I make sure to cure my angels as well, just in case. Turn 2, I wait with my angels, but take out the goblin stacks with my titan, just to ensure the angels don't take more damage than necessary. The pikemen and ogres moving forward lets the angels freely infiltrate the backline, taking out the lizardmen first and the cyclops afterwards. The titan then handles the melee units, and all purple towns are conquered. Purple is still not vanquished though, so there is at least one more hero lurking around somewhere. Since I don't have scouting, I'm not gonna go looking for them. If they return to take their towns back, I'll just return as well. On to the blue towns now. Blue's castle town is guarded by Dessa, who is swatted away easily, and Tamika, who I also don't really bother fighting manually, since she's so weak. Easy dub. Blue's first fortress town is guarded by Voy, who is a navigation specialist on a map without water. Impressive. Very nice. Her army is nothing special but auto combat did not manage to do this without losses. It's really not a challenge at all, so I struggle to see how it is possible to lose anything in this fight. Not much strategy is used by me here, except waiting on turn 1, which apparently is some genius trick the AI has no answer to. Lucky me! Though, since I haven't faced Blue's Fortress army split up between two different heroes already, I suspect the final town should not have a particularly big army either. Splitting army is probably the biggest factor in making these kinds of challenges possible, so I'm not complaining. 
Purple's last hero manages to take Blue's last remaining town and vanquishes Blue. Funnily enough, he doesn't have enough movement points to actually enter the town, so I just waltz in and flag it, before challenging an old pal of ours, Yulun. Gotta be careful about that cure specialty. Poor guy has a weakened army and no mana, but I won't be merciful. I wait on turn 1 before I start hitting almost randomly. This fight could have been done way better, but there was absolutely no chance I was losing any units here anyway. Purple is vanquished, scenario completed. But I think this was played very poorly by me. The titan was both a blessing and a curse, as I was basically freestyling my strategy from the second I got it in the refugee camp. Oh well, on to the last one. Time for the final scenario of this four-parter. We have to acknowledge the scenario choices here. Expert navigation, which is fine as it is a waterfield map, but the other two are literally either mage skill level 1 or mage skill level 3. Unless I'm missing something here, why would you ever choose mage skill level 1 over level 3? Super odd stuff if you ask me, and I, of course, choose mage skill level 3 as it is literally so many resources saved. The goal of this scenario is to defeat all enemy heroes and take all their towns, which are all located underground. The overworld map is very narrow on both sides, with my three starting towns all on a thin line on the west side, while the east side has no towns at all. Orange starts with five towns, all dungeon towns. The easternmost town is usually the one which is built up the most and usually houses their main hero, Arlek. Continuing the campaign tradition of using unusual heroes, Astral will be my main man in this one, as magic will be crucial for success and he has the best chances of getting all I'm looking for. I reset a bunch of times until he starts off with earth magic as well as expert wisdom. Both earth and air magic are necessary, but wizards like Astral have a much higher chance of leveling into air magic, so if I can just RNG into earth magic to begin with, I save myself a lot of hassle. The early game strategy is, as usual in this campaign, to build a portal of glory in week 1, then start exploring outside my starting area in week 2. I start moving Astral towards the castle town immediately, switching places with Christian with all three starting heroes picking up resources and flagging mines as they go. Genova is off to Rhone in the north, just doing her thing. While the ocean is full of resources and some good artifacts, sort of hellfire from a shipwreck survivor on the east coast for instance, I don't need to spend time collecting those. Tempo is important here, and I want to spend my tempo getting down to the underground. There is a very, very important artifact close to one of the subterranean gates I want to get my hands on. Spellbinder's hat as it gives the hero equipping it access to all level 5 spells. This means I get Dimension Door and Fly, both of which will be heavily used. Now, if I can get Town Portal from my Castle Town's Mage Guild, it only needs to be leveled up once to have a chance of getting it, I will have the ultimate trifecta of mobility spells. These three spells, plus the spell Implosion, is why I want Earth and Air Magic on my main hero. On day 7, I build the Portal of Glory, setting me up for some cave exploration. On week 2, day 1, Astral picks up the three available angels and starts heading for the subterranean gate, picking up some experience and stats along the way. I have made sure to pick up intelligence as well, as having enough mana to abuse Dimension Door is really damn important. With Expert Air, I can cast Dimension Door four times per turn, which is very mana heavy. Week 2, day 3, I finally enter the underground, immediately heading for the Spellbinder's Hat. When picking it up, I still don't have air magic, but I'm confident I will get it. In the nearby area, there are a lot of stats available. Plus 1 attack, plus 1 power, plus 2 defense, and a plus 4 attack artifact, all of which will be acquired of course. On week 2, day 6, the day of reckoning has arrived. Will I get town portal from the castle mage guild, or do I need to look for it in the other towns? Of course I darn diddly did. I'm set up for success now. Heading back to the castle town with Astral in time for the weekly angel top up, I of course also pick up town portal. I build up a stables and town portal down to my tower town. There are two artifacts here I want. Dragonbone Greaves and Dragonwing Tabard, netting me plus 3 in both power and knowledge. Taking out the archmages guarding the tabard levels me into air magic, and if I didn't think this attempt was going well until now, I definitely do now. Cause holy moly, everything is lining up perfectly. Final thing to do now is to upgrade the angels to archangels, and now orange is gonna feel Astral's wrath. On week 3, day 5, I meet up with the first orange hero, Lorelei. She's just a scout guarding a fortless town, so I let Autocombat take her out just for the fun of it. 
Getting access to this town gives me a mana vortex, which, together with expert intelligence, quadruples my mana. I feel so overpowered at the moment. 11 knowledge? That means 440 mana. The most mobile old man ever in Astral over here. Just two days after taking Orange's first town, I find the second one completely unguarded. The AI is not great at estimating how far you can move if you have Fly or Dimension Door, so this is a freebie. While all of this has been going on, I started building up my tower town, and Christian has gotten a couple of giants to play around with, so he can clear the surrounding area. These will eventually be titans, and join Astral's forces. Week 4, day 3, I take a third orange town, before setting my sights on the fourth one to the west. After taking the fourth one, I take some time to visit the Library of Enlightenment, getting a sweet plus 2 to all my stats. Some scattered orange heroes try to take back their conquered towns, but this is why Town Portal is so absolutely amazing here. I can defend from essentially anywhere. Without Town Portal here, this would be such a slog. Malekith had been lurking around a couple of dungeon towns, so I finally confront him on week 4, day 7. But he flees in quick combat, so I decide to manually fight him. Why bother, you ask? Maybe as an artifact or two, so if I can defeat him without fleeing, I can snag them off him. And what do you know? Boots of Levitation. Completely useless for me here, but at least I got him. The next day, I Dimension Door over to Orange's last town, which Arlac is defending. After taking quick stock of his army, I decide I don't want to go into a siege fight against him right now, so instead I explore a bit around this town. Taking a gold mine and getting a decent plus 2 power Arlac hasn't gotten himself yet is a nice bonus. I also decide to check out the Dragon Utopia, but in literally every playthrough before this, it had already been cleared. Not this time though, so let's see what we get. As it was a mini Utopia, the reward isn't great, but the Titan's Gladius is at least useful. The rest of the artifacts though are pretty bad. Month 2, week 1, day 5, Alamar is close to flagging a dungeon town, so I make sure to stop him in his tracks. What I'm doing at the moment is building up a stronger army in relation to Arlex army. Having army income from both the castle and tower towns means I will get stronger faster, so when I eventually pick up the available soon to be titans, I should be good to go. Day 1 the next week, I feel ready. 5 titans and 11 archangels should be enough. What's even better is that I catch Arlac outside of his town, as he's attempting to get the same plus 2 power I cleared in his town area. 3 dimension doors later, and it's fight time. I split the Archangel stack into two stacks, just so I can have more Archangel Resurrections available. There are several dangerous stacks here. The 92 Evil Eyes, the 114 Harpy Hags, the 15 Manticores, and the 5 Red Dragons can all do some damage. Turn 1, I implosion the Evil Eyes, and what do you know? 90 of them instantly gone. This spell is so insanely good, it's not even fair. I wait with all my units, losing two Archangels to the relentless onslaught of attacks and Lightning Bolt from Arlac. The Titans and the three Archangels start chipping away at the Manticores, while the six Archangels take out the Dragons. Turn 2, I implosion the Harpy Hag stack back to Narnia. Resurrect the damaged Archangel stack before taking out the Manticores. Turn 3, an Angel double team takes out the Troglodytes while Implosion wrecks the Medusa Queens, and Angel Morale makes sure the Evil Eyes are unfortunately closing their lids for good. This went way better than expected. Now all that is left is to take Orange's last town, which has black dragons? I think I timed this Arlac attack perfectly. It could have gotten quite difficult if I had to siege against him with black dragons, and Scorpicors for that matter. A fairly straightforward fight, I don't think I registered that quick combat one without losses, so I did it manually. But no matter. Fighting their last hero is on the agenda now. And it's Alamar again. Try running now, dummy. An absolutely brutal overkilling implosion takes out the entire Minotaur King population of Arathia, before the Archangels finishes the job. While I wasn't happy with my play in the previous scenario, this one was much better. Heroes of Might and Magic 3, liberation campaign with no unit loss, completed, done and dusted. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and a comment. I appreciate it more than you know. Hello. Long live the king. The definitive Necropolis campaign. Penultimate in the main storyline. Necro means skeletons everywhere, right? Legions of skeletons, right? 
Skeletons, skeletons, skeletons. Right? Heck no. I'm gonna be the most creative, least necro necro player ever. Stay tuned. As will be the norm from now on, the rules are in the description, but the short version is no losing units. Let's go. This campaign follows a similar progression style as Liberation, the previous campaign. No heroes will follow me from scenario to scenario, but there are quest artifacts available. I will, again, not take advantage of this, just because I don't need to. First scenario is a Griffin's Heart. The scenario bonus choices are very varied this time. A scroll of Death Ripple, a Black Knight, and a Skeleton Transformer. There's an absolute clear choice here. A bonus which lets me instantly go out and clear the map of guards. The single Black Knight. So with the Black Knight in hand, I start resetting. Looking for the correct hero for me to blast through this scenario. Fant. Fant starts with the spell Animate Dead, which is essentially a resurrection for undead units. This map size is small. I start in the north, red in the south. The underground is also at play here, but overall, the map is just very cramped. The scenario goal is to enter Stone Castle, Red's Castle Town, with the Spirit of Oppression artifact. So while I technically don't need to eliminate Red, it makes my life so much simpler if I do. In order to beat Red's hero, I will build up the Hall of Darkness, upgrade it, and attack with a bunch of Dread Knights when the time comes. You might think, if I venture out with just the one Black Knight and it dies, I won't be able to animate it, right? Correct. But the guards will fight with just the one Black Knight are very doable. Especially since we got the magic arrow from the mage guild we built on day one. Septiana flags an ore pit to the north, and Fant encounters a garrison with 10 pikemen and 10 archers. Quick combat takes care of that. Says it all about the Black Knight's strength, doesn't it? Since all Necropolis heroes have necromancy, how will I deal with getting a bunch of weak skeletons, which are basically target practice for ranged units? Easy. I can just store them in garrisons, set them as mine guards, or just trade them to Septiana. So I will be history's first necromancer to despise skeletons. Or at least I think I am. Flagging a few mines, Fant encounters obstacle number one. The Marksman. Only 18 this time. Lucky. I've seen up to 25, which would have made this a whole lot more difficult. I absent-mindedly don't wait on my first turn after casting Magic Arrow, but the Black Knight is tanky enough to just survive a bunch of attacks anyway. A few magic arrows and some knight on man action and this fight is taken care of. This pathing through the underground is mostly just to farm experience, as I will need a few days to build up my town anyway. On week 1 day 6 I build the Hall of Darkness, and on week 2 day 2 I upgrade it. Being a little short on gold, I wait until week 2 day 4 to upgrade all my 6 black knights to dread knights, but now it's time to attack red. Breezing past the garrison and the pikemen as well, Loinis is standing ready to take a beating. Waiting the first turn, Loinis hastes his 74 pikemen and half-heartedly tries to defend his archers. I then attack the pikemen, blocking the archers in the process. The Dread Knights take a beating from the castle forces, and I have already lost two of them. Turn 4, I cast Animate Dead, raising the two dead undead knights from the dead into undeadness again. Apparently the game thinks you can resurrect undead units. Very logical. The now 6 Dread Knights take out the archers and then survive with a massive 2 HP before eliminating Loinus's final units, the pikemen. Without animate dead, this fight is really darn hard. Leaving the raised skeletons in the gem pond, I move to take Stone Castle, which is guarded by a single pikeman, which gives me one skeleton. Annoying. This slows my map movement down a lot. Now to finish the quest to get me Spirit of Oppression. To do this, I need to go down the other subterranean gate, which is in the southwest corner. I bring along another three Dread Knights before heading down underground. Everything is guarded by monks or zealots here, so I don't want any skeletons on me. The first zealot fight is quick combated. I lead the three skeletons I get in the ore pit before taking on the final fight of this scenario, which quick combat also takes care of. A bit anticlimactic, but oh well. Here we find a pendant of total recall. Leaving the last skeletons in the same ore pit, I turn the pendant in for the hourglass of the evil hour, which again is turned in for the pendant of dispassion, which again is turned in for the spirit of oppression, which is then brought to stone castle. Incredibly, while this took me a whole 7 minutes of gameplay, we still couldn't finish this before month 2, week 1, day 6. But it is done. Quick, efficient, 
beautiful. On to the next one. Season of Harvest is up next. The scenario bonuses are all related to getting more skeletons this time. Vampire's Cowl, which gives plus 10% to Necromancy. The Necromancy Amplifier, the structure giving plus 10% to Necromancy as well. Or Unearthed Graves, giving plus 6 to skeleton production every week. As the latter two are both easy to build, and the Vampire's Cowl is not available outside of this bonus, I'm going with the Cowl. The goal of this scenario is very straightforward. Amass 2,500 skeletons among all heroes and towns within month 4. I'm technically up against red and blue, but they have fortless towns and no heroes, so they don't really play any part in this scenario at all. Both Vidomina and Vokial are always starting heroes here. Vidomina will be my main, as she has the necromancy specialty, which will increase my skeleton gains compared to other necro heroes. The map is split with a narrow ocean in the middle. I'm on the east side, which only houses mines and a couple of dwellings, while on the much bigger west side is where the action will be. The plan of attack is to use the two Black Knights Vokial starts with, trade them to Vidomina, then do a lot of fights on the western continent. I will also build up the Vampire Lords in my Necrotown and send another hero over the ocean after a while. Every single fight on the western continent is against tier 1 or tier 2 units from Rampart and Castle. To be perfectly honest, I don't think this scenario is especially interesting, so I will mostly talk about the setup and show a few of the fights to illustrate how I do it. The most annoying part of this scenario is the fact that I gain skeletons after every fight. I know, I know, that's kind of the point here. But it means I have to do every fight manually, in order to not lose any units, as the auto combat always goes max aggressive in fights, losing skeletons every time. This also means I can't do fights against archers or marksmen, unless I trade the skeletons away before the fights. Most of the fights with Vidomina and her two Black Knights play out the same way. Walk forward with the Black Knights in order to draw enemy attention, hide with my skeletons, and let the knights kill the low tier units slowly but surely. The idea behind this scenario is to take advantage of the skeleton transformer as well. Some units will join me, and there are some creature dwellings as well as units in the towns I'll conquer. These are supposed to be brought to the skeleton transformer via a pair of boots of levitation, found in the bottom right corner of the western continent. What I'm doing instead is clearing the map from the northeast, going to the northwest with Vidomina, and towards the middle with the second hero I brought over here, Thant. Thant, not the same one from the previous scenario, still has the anime dead spell for extra safety. On week 4, day 4, I enter sort of a treasure area. A small space with lots of necro units, which will always join, as well as Sandro, who starts at level 5. As Thant somehow, at a much higher level, still hasn't gotten expert necromancy, while Sandro has, Sandro takes over as my second hero. Up to this point, I have amassed a bunch of random pikemen and centaurs, as well as the necro units I'm not using with my two main heroes. So Thant's new task is to bring them to Septiana, who will then take all these straggler units to the scale transformer. Meanwhile, while all of this is happening, Vokial has dutifully recruited every white and skeleton from the two dwellings on the eastern continent. Septiana, on month 2, week 1, day 5, has the pleasure of transforming a whole lot of creatures, netting me a sweet 936 skeletons in my hometown. Thant's new assignment now is to follow Sandro around, taking all of his skeletons, which will allow Sandro to use Vampire Lords to do fights against ranged units, which is very helpful, as there was a month of the Lizard Man, which is both beneficial and annoying. If only they were melee, man. As we are closing in on the 2500 skeletons overall, Vidomina gets the honor of using the Vampire Lords, while Sandro is the new Thant, the Necro Water Boy. Breezing through a few Lizardmen fights, the final batch of skeletons are raised from a battle against 62 Lizardmen, which is just quick combated. On month 2, week 3, day 5, a bit over a month ahead of schedule, this PvE scenario is done. I wish this had a much tighter schedule, as it would be way more intense. First time I played through this, I thought I had to be done by month number 3, as I misread before I started, so I was trying to find optimizations here and there, but it is really not necessary. Anyway, more interesting stuff in the next scenario, thankfully. Corporeal punishment is the next scenario. I bet you thought this is pronounced corporeal or corporal, but I checked before recording this, of course. Bonus choices are largely irrelevant, as I won't use any of them. 
but I picked the Pendant of Death for no particular reason. The goal here is to defeat the Death Knight Mott, and he's hiding in his Necro Town in the southeast. I start with two Necro Towns, one in the middle of the map and one in the northwest. Red starts with three towns, one in the east, the one Mott is hiding in, and one in the southwest. All zones are divided by red garrisons with some skeleton warriors, zombies and wraiths. There are a few ways to do this scenario with no unit losses. Thant is an obvious choice, as he, as mentioned in both the previous scenarios, has the animate dead specialty, and just abuse that, but he has necromancy, and dragging those slow skeletons around is annoying. Using Deemer is also a pretty good choice, as he can use his Meteor Shower specialty along with Warlock's naturally high power stat to smack Mott around. Lastly, Ballista specialists like Arlac and, like in this attempt, Pyre can clear the map early, which is great for tempo. The advantage of the Ballista is that I can do pretty much every neutral fight the second I get vampires, as most of the fights are against Walking Dead. Pyre also starts with logistics, which is always very helpful to have. I ignore building creature dwellings in my northern town, but in the middle town I aim to have a Hall of Darkness built in week 1 along with the Citadel. In week 2 I will go for a Dragon Vault, in order to get Bone Dragons and later Ghost Dragons. Secondary skills are largely irrelevant in this scenario. Artillery, which Pyre starts with, is nice as I can actually aim and do some good damage with the Ballista. Having Earth Magic would be nice as well, because Pyre does not get a lot of power naturally, and because I plan on getting Animate Dead from the Mage Guild, it is very likely to get the Necro Towns. I'd need 4 power casting basic Animate Dead, 3 power with Advanced Earth, and only 1 power with Expert Earth in order to animate any potentially lost Ghost Dragons. Of course I also need Basic Wisdom to learn Animate Dead to begin with, but that is a guaranteed offered skill every 6th level for my heroes like Pyre. Using the Ballista plus Vampire strat to clear all the mines in the middle zone and picking up some permanent stats, Every one of these early fights play out the same way. Walking Dead and Zombies will never do the 250 damage necessary to take out the Ballista in time. They are simply too weak. I head back to the middle town with Pyre to pick up the available Black Knights, and I even have the time to upgrade them to Dread Knights before I head out again to explore and collect more resources. I clear the northeast garrison and pick up everything close to the garrison. There is a red town further into the zone, but I don't want to spend too much time here as I want to attack Mott before week 4, so he doesn't have too much time to build up fortifications, and the Ballista really does not scale well into the later parts of the game. After collecting all the nearby resources, I head to the western part of the middle zone. There are a couple of really good artifacts I want to get my hands on before I eventually head down to Mott. Buckler of the Null King, giving plus 4 defense, and Dragon Scale Armor, giving plus 4 to both attack and defense giving me a massive might stat bonus. In the meantime, I've also built up the mage kill to level 3, in order to look for the animate dead spell. Pyre is really not much of a magic hero, especially with her quite shitty spellcasting stats right now, but having the opportunity to animate one ghost dragon or one dread knight could be clutch in a pinch. On week 3, day 4, I have recruited my final army. 9 dread knights and 3 ghost dragons. It's time to head down to greet Mott. On the way, I take out Isra who just wanders around with a bare bones army, pun definitely intended. Tamika is also present on the way, and as I don't want to end my turn right outside of Mott's town, I take her out as well. Why do I not want to stay right outside of Mott's town, you ask? Well, it's cursed ground, restricting spell casting to level 1 spells, which would stop me from casting the level 3 spell animate dead, should it be needed. However, sieging him is not on cursed ground, so it's actually safer for me to siege, which is unusual. Unfortunately for me, I never got Earth Magic as a secondary skill, so the 4 power I have is just barely enough to animate the Ghost Dragon, so I don't have much room for error here. Mott's army has two main threats, the 39 whites and the 66 skeletons. However, the most pressing issue is to take out the liches, as the AI typically does not come out of the castle gates unless their shooters are dead. I also can't just magic arrow them down, as I want enough mana to cast animate dead should it be necessary. So on turn 1, I use my one available magic arrow cast on the liches before waiting with both my stacks. Mott magic arrows my dread knights, which could be an issue, doing 30 damage each time. Incredibly enough, Mott just rushes out the gates, so I get a beautiful double shot with my ballista, taking out 32 skeletons. The dread knights then take out the remaining skellies, 
and the dragons hit the walking dead. Turn 2, I hit the whites with the ghost dragons and the dread knights. Mott then hits the dread knights with all his units, but with my superior might stats, they survive with 27 HP. The ballista then kills the vampires, and on turn 3, I take out the two remaining opposing units. Surprisingly easy, and I didn't even have to use the animate dead cast I thought I would need. A bit lucky with how the fight played out, but I think I played it reasonably well. With Mott taken out, I can head on to the final scenario. From day to night, the last scenario of this campaign. It's on an XL map with an underground area as well, where I start with 3 necropolis towns and red starts with 5 castle towns. We start out without mobility spells like town portal or dimension door, so this is all leading up to an epic final battle, right? Massive armies, hordes of skeletons and powerful undead creatures, right? Well. The scenario bonus choices include three ghost dragons, and these three ghost dragons lets me tempo this scenario to hell and back, so of course that's what I'm picking. I reset a few times, looking for a logistic specialist. I end up with Gunner, and trade the three ghost dragons over to him, and go directly for one of the three garrisons separating my starting area from Red's massive area. Quick combat makes quick work of this, and already on day one, Gunner has expert logistics. I am speed. The three necro starting heroes I have, I just send out to gather resources. The strategy here is not to build any necro units, but to build up to a portal of glory in the first castle town I conquer. Not every castle town can build a portal of glory here, so the pathing I take is very deliberate. On day 4, I find the first castle town, defended by Orin. Here we can see some of the strength of the ghost dragons, especially when they are split up into stacks of 1. The aging effect. Aging reduces the affected stack's HP in half, which is incredibly strong, especially against relatively high HP units like the pikemen. Getting this town on day 4 is actually quite advantageous insofar that Red usually builds the correct buildings to support a weak 1 portal of glory. Red already built a mage guild level 1, blacksmith and barracks, all necessary for angels. All that remains is the monastery and we are good to go. Gunner, however, won't be sitting around waiting for the angels, which is why I recruit Zydar. I do not want a hero with necromancy, as the skeletons raised just slow me down, and map movement points are, as mentioned in the first video, based on the slowest units, so I only want fast units on my main heroes. And skeletons are also just made out of paper, well, technically bones, and perish to anything looking remotely in their direction. So Zydar flags some mines and collects resources, while Gunner moves towards the next town on the list, the southeast town, usually guarded by Tyris. We can really, really see the power of logistic specialty here. Gunner can move so far, especially on roads. It's just incredible. The alternative strategy I could use here is building up mage guilds to level 4, looking for town portal to be mobile on the map. But as this map is so road heavy, I can move super far even without town portal. Tyrus's barebones army is chanceless against Gunner, and two of the main towns are already conquered. Nothing of value will be built here, as I don't plan on going back, unless Red uses the underground to return to take this town back. On day 6, I build the portal of glory in the first castle town. Fortunately, I am able to build a castle as well on day 7, which will net me a beautiful 3 angels available in week 2. Pretty good considering I didn't even get the first castle town until halfway into the week. Week 2, day 1, I recruit all the angels, build the stables, and Zydar heads out towards his goal, the eastern red town. Not quite as mobile as Gunnar, but with the stables boost, Zydar can move a fair distance himself. Gunnar, meanwhile, uses his extreme mobility to head towards the two western towns. Hitting all the towns this early means Red hasn't had any real time to build up fortifications or creature dwellings, which is very good. Otherwise, this strategy would be pretty risky. Week 2, day 2, quick combat loses a dragon to the siege of castle town number 3, so I have to do this manually. For an upgraded tier 7 unit, the ghost dragons are incredibly squishy. 200 HP and 17 defense are actually so bad. I try to split the focus of the AI's attacks between all my stacks, but the defending units can just open the castle gate to move around, which I totally forgot. So after round 2 of attacks, one of my dragons is left at 10 HP, meaning I have to move it out of the way. I focus the griffins for as long as possible to take advantage of the curse I cast on round 1. 
After the curse runs out on the griffins, I cast it again on the swordsmen to lower their damage as well. A couple of very late aging effects later and the last defending units are down. A surprisingly difficult fight, especially considering there are no arrow towers or a hero defending. Zaydar then finds an unguarded fortless castle town before he heads westwards as well. Gunnar takes the final red town, which is also unguarded, but red still has heroes on the map somewhere. Usually, they appear around the western towns when in this position, so I place Gunnar in the middle of both of these towns and send Zaydar down to the southeast to deter any heroes from approaching this town. Unfortunately, I guessed wrong in this case, and Theodorus appears close to the eastern town, which I, of course, don't have any heroes close to. Cuthbert then appears in the west, and I'm pulled in different directions. Typical. It's week 3 day 1, so I recruit Olemma from the first castle town to recruit the two available angels in order to trade them to Gunnar. Cuthbert's army looked big enough to threaten my ghost dragons, so a bit of a reinforcement is necessary. Zaydar still heads for the eastern town, while Gunnar hunts Cuthbert down. With the angel reinforcement, Cuthbert is swatted away quite easily. Auto combat can do this quite convincingly. This scenario is probably one of my favorites so far, as I love trying to play fast and with high tempo. Being able to leave my starting zone on day one with a sizable army is very satisfying. Although I think starting with three ghost dragons is way too good of a bonus. But this is why I love this game. It can be so imbalanced. And in single player games like this, I do love that imbalance. Finally, Zydar catches up to Theodorus on week three day six and shows him who's boss in a quick fight. Gunnar, aka Sonic the Hedgehog, once again shows his extreme mobility by reaching the now final red town before Zydar would, even with Zydar having a massive head start. An absolutely dominating last siege fight seals the deal, and the scenario and campaign is finished. Just one more campaign left in the main restoration of Arathia story. Long live the king, and long live my units. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment, or subscribe. It's all appreciated more than you know. I really appreciate all the support I've gotten so far, especially all the nice comments. It really makes my day. And I hope you have a great day as well. Hey though! I have just one question for you. Are you ready? Ready for what? Are you ready for the final mainline restoration of Arathia campaign song for the father? The rules are on screen for a few seconds, and also in the pastebin link in the description. Let's go! Safe passage is up first. While the scenario bonuses are quite good on paper, at least the logistics and the boots of speed, the map is small so the boots aren't all that amazing, and the logistics is for Nimbus, the one fixed starting hero, who I will not use for any fights anyway because of her necro skill. But we choose logistics anyway. Nimbus can always scout a bit later, so it will come useful. As mentioned, the map is small. I start in the south with one castle town, while purple starts in the middle of the map with two necro towns. The goal in this scenario is to bring Nimbus to High Castle, the castle town I start with, with the Statesman Medal, which she starts with. In order to do that, I need to visit the three key masters tents so Nimbus can pass through the border guards. What the intended strategy from the developers is here, I'm not sure, but I'm quite gung-ho in general in games, so I just look for the most aggressive way to win early. And that way is to use Christian, my beloved. Or well, I don't really love Christian, I love his massive Ballista. Due to the small map size, I can reach the first purple town on day 2. This siege fight takes advantage of the AI's affinity with targeting war machines, like the Ballista. Now, you might ask, why not just reset for a better hero on day 1, build a blacksmith in the castle town and buy a ballista and do this strategy without Christian? Well, dear curious viewer, I did try that, and it turns out you need the artillery skill to do this, which Christian has, in order to do enough damage quickly enough. And you might also find that Christian will be useful in the next scenario as well. 25 million ballista shots later, and the final walking dead is down. Now, here comes the genius part, if I may say so myself. I build a tube of souls in the necro town, recruit the seven whites, and switch the pikemen out with the whites. The whites have two advantages, one of which we can see in the fight against the zombies here. They regenerate to full HP at the beginning of their turn. 
This means I can take multiple retaliations from the zombies without losing any units, even though a white just has a measly 18 HP. Without the ability to hit the zombies, I run the risk of losing the ballista before taking all of them out. With this ballistic strategy, I take the second Necrotown on day 3. And now comes the even more big brain part of this approach. Since the ballista is not present when defending a town, I build a citadel, which means I can control the arrow tower. Okay, artillery doesn't really matter, since Moander just has a stack of 36 skeletons and a stack of 6 walking dead. This fight would be won, artillery or not. However, the second white advantage is sometimes important here. They fly. So, in cases where the AI has a bigger army, I would need to be able to fly over the castle walls to chip away at the enemy forces before the catapult takes out the arrow tower. This time, it doesn't matter, but it has come in handy in previous attempts. The campaign is set up like the first few ones I did. My heroes are transferred to the next scenarios, so I can finally superpower a hero or two again. I have already recruited a third hero, Tazar. Tazar is a bit of a risky choice because of his armor specialty. As mentioned in the Spoils of War campaign, there is a bug which makes heroes with armor take the armor bonus as increased damage from arrow towers, instead of decreased damage. This is obviously amplified with Tazar's specialty. But it's a calculated risk, as I will not siege too much in this campaign overall. There is a bunch of spells and skills I want to get on my main hero. As usual, I want Town Portal and Dimension Door. Fly would also be nice. Resurrection as well. In order to be able to even learn these, I need Expert Wisdom. And to make possible good use of these spells, I want at least Advanced Earth Magic and any form of Air Magic. But the higher level, the better. Offense would be nice to make fighting easier, and logistics for even more map mobility in addition to Town Portal and Dimension Door would be nice. To be honest, armor is probably one of the skills I don't want, but oh well. From the skills I'd like on my hero, Warlocks and Overlords are probably the most desired hero classes. The problem with Warlocks is that most of them have a bunch of useless skills already, while Overlords often have better skills in comparison. The dream is Gunner, but I have had some brilliant playthroughs with Days as well. Still, it's Tazar this time, so I will just have to make the most of it, and avoid sieging. To set myself up in the best way possible for the next scenarios, I have to level up Tazar and build up mage guilds to look for the spells I want. The strategy from here on out is to build up a Hall of Darkness in the first Necrotown, and use Black Knights, and later Dread Knights, to take all the fights on the map with Tazar. There are 6 learning stones and a bunch of chests, which will all be collected by Tazar and used for experience. The only possibly challenging fights left are the two Black Knight fights. Before taking those on, I flag every mine, collect resources, and visit all of the learning stones I can reach. On week 3, day 6, I take on the first Black Knight fight with my now 8 Dread Knights. If I had used basically any other hero, I would suffer losses in the quick combat. But with Tazar, I can just breeze through. Week 4, day 2, I take on the other Black Knight fight with the same result. The very next day, I build the first Mage Guild to level 5, and what do you know? A bunch of absolutely wonderful spells. Town Portal, Meteor Shower and Implosion are all amazing spells, but no Dimension Door. I begin building up the second Mage Guild to level 5 in hopes of getting Dimension Door there. Meanwhile, I visit every learning stone with both Christian and Nimbus and collect the permanent stats available with Christian. Might as well when I have the time. Building the second mage guild to 5 nets me another implosion. No big deal, more chances to find Dimension Door later. Taking stock of Tazar's situation, it's looking quite good. Expert Wisdom and Expert Earth Magic are both excellent. Having logistics is great as well. Leadership isn't terrible but missing air magic is a bit of an issue. Luckily, I have a solution in the next scenario. His stats look quite okay, but 3 knowledge is quite low, which means I can't spam town portal as much as I'd like later. Overall though, I'm satisfied. With all the necessary preparations done, I send Nimbus to High Castle. It's on to the next scenario. United Front is next on the menu, and to be honest, there's only one choice to go for here from the scenario bonus choices. The 35 Grand Elves. They're ranged, reasonably fast, and do a lot of damage. The other two choices are pretty bad for tier 3 units to be honest. The map is extra large. 
I start with four towns in the south and east. One castle, one tower, one rampart, and one necropolis. Purple starts with four necropolis towns in the remaining area to the west-northwest. The goal of this scenario is to eliminate all enemies and take all their towns. Nothing complicated. Let's go. The solution to the air magic issue is pretty straightforward. The witch shut to the north. I reset until it teaches air magic. And due to the fact I can town portal close to this witch shut, Tazar can get air magic whenever necessary. Which of course will be as soon as possible. However, the early game on this scenario is a bit chaotic. Due to my leveling up Christian and the majority of fights being against Walking Dead, I can use him to take a lot of fights close to his starting location. Which I will do of course. Close to his spawn location as well is a mercenary camp, which for some reason often has good units. Previously I have recruited angels, giants, ghost dragons and, like in this case, behemoths. This obviously makes all of Christian's fights even easier. I town portal with Tazar to the Rampart Town where the Grand Elves from the scenario bonus are placed. I split them into 3 stacks, leave one stack of 11 in the Rampart Town and town portal up to the Necro Town where Iona is. I pick up the air magic from the Witch Hut and trade one stack of elves to Iona so she can start exploring and doing fights as well. Leaving Tazar in the Necro Town, I build a mage guild so he can restore his mana and begin exploring on day 2 using his elf stack. The final elf stack is left to a tavern hero which in this case is Solmir. So this means I will use 4 heroes to flag mines and take fights, while Nimbus is the only one left to just pick up free resources on the map. And this brings me to the scenario strategy. This should be fairly predictable at this point, but of course I will build a portal of glory in the castle town and use angels to take out purple. The portal of glory build path is just too good compared to the other tier 7 dwellings, and the angels, and later archangels, are just too versatile to ignore. There is some risk in having 4 heroes with relatively weak armies running around. Purple can show up pretty much anywhere and do some damage, even if their heroes are also quite weak. Only Tazar has good reliable spellcasting to defend himself. Solmir clears west-southwest from the Rampart Town, Christian clears north of the Rampart Town, Iona clears around the Necro Town, while Tazar clears from the Tower Town westwards towards the Castle Town. This is a reasonably efficient way to clear the map. Do I get every resource this way? No. But I get all I need to build up the Portal of Glory and a castle in the castle town. Which is all I need in week 1. On day 7, I build a castle to provide Tazar a possible 3 angels to recruit next week. Week 2 day 1 also shows the first purple hero so far. Vokial. Thankfully, he has a stack of walking dead on him, so he's very immobile and not really a threat but I'd rather not lose any of my flagged mines. I also build a stable to increase Tazar's movement points, so I can start invading purple territory quite efficiently this week. Town portaling to the tower town, I leave the stack of elves so Solmir can pick them up and start doing some bigger fights himself. Tazar then town portals to the Rampart town to move in on purple. On week 2 day 2, I confront Vokial. In quick combat, he flees so I figure I can trick him into not fleeing, which would net me any potential artifact he possesses. But he just flees without losses instead. Big fail. On week 2 day 5, I reach the first purple town, which is just barely guarded. Quick combat breezes past this fight. A lot of the terrain in the purple area is cursed ground, which is quite annoying to deal with. It means I can't cast spells above level 1, which also means that I can't cast town portal when standing on this terrain. Week 2 day 7, the second purple town is next up on my to conquer list, and it's completely free. I notice it's built up quite a bit for AI standards, which probably means there's a somewhat strong hero in the area. Checking the tavern tells me Clavius is their strongest hero, so I go looking for him. And what do you know? He's literally right there. Quick combat makes him flee, but again I believe in my abilities to take out an AI hero before he flees. Using the standard waiting with all my units strategy, Clavius defends his ranged unit, the Liches, and moves forward with his vampires. Due to Tazar's relatively weak offensive capabilities compared to his defense, I don't do a lot of damage. I need all three angels to take out a measly 7 vampires. I really don't want to cast any spells in this fight, since I only have 11 mana. If I cast anything, I don't have the 12 mana needed to cast Town Portal next turn which would slow me down. 
So I move in with all my angels to hit the skeletons and the whites in round 2 and hit the liches in round 3. I do a bit of quick maths and come to the conclusion that if I only hit with my angels and don't cast any damaging spells, Clavius could flee with 3 walking dead remaining. So I have to bite the sour apple, as we say in Norway, and cast a magic arrow. Was it worth it? Well, I get a color of conjuring and a quiet eye of the dragon. So no, it was definitely not worth it. Hopefully inflicted some emotional damage on the AI though. The next day, I have no choice but to explore a bit around the area, since I don't have any mana left. I visit the Library of Enlightenment and pick up three good artifacts. Dragonbone Greaves, Dragon Scale Shield, a necklace of dragon teeth, which nets me a solid boost to my stats. I know there's a magic well to the north, so I could always restore some mana that way. On the way there, I pick up a dragonwing tabard, greater Null's flail, and shield of the yawning dead as well. My mana pool is now enormous, and my fighting stats are excellent. Returning to the castle town, I upgrade the portal of glory, and upgrade my angels to archangels as well. I town portal to the middle necro town, and set my sights on the eastern purple town. Meanwhile, I start building up the tower mage guild towards level 5, looking for dimension door. On week 3, day 6, I reach mage guild level 5, and I get dimension door on the first try. If I didn't, I could always build a library here to give me one extra spell on every tier in this guild, but no need this time. I still build that the next day though, and get fly. Just absolutely perfect. Resurrection as well, which is a nice bonus. I return to pick up these spells before I finally actually go for the third purple town. I went the wrong way on my last expedition there, because I always mix up the pathing in this scenario, but second time's the charm. At the same time, Aislinn has been lurking around, so I take him out on the way. Using Dimension Door for mobility, I find Clavius V2 walking around. He flees in quick combat again, but of course I'm not letting him off the hook this time either. This time, I can just run him down with my Archangels and a massive 16-16 melee stat line. Taking the third purple town, finally, on week 4, day 4, there's only one more left up in the northwest. Vokial is showing his face again as well, this time with a more sizable army. This fight is not on cursed ground, so I can always cast the Archangel Resurrect if needed. Even with the strategic lightning bolt, I don't have the damage to take out his walking dead, so he flees. I can live with that. Month 2, week 1, day 1, I find the final purple town. I quick combat the fight, check view air to see where the remaining purple heroes are, and find Straker outside the middle necro town and Tau Portal Tazar there. I can just barely not reach, but since purple has no towns now, Straker attacks and is just absolutely obliterated. Town portaling to the northwest necro town, I find the final purple hero, Thant. The absolutely epic final battle of the ages is ended by a simple chain lightning. Good try Thant, good try. Purple has been vanquished and the final scenario of the restoration of Arathia main storyline is left. Exciting times. This one goes out to all the Brits out there. Final scenario for king and country. The scenario bonuses in this one are incredible. Helm of Heavenly Enlightenment is amazing. Tome of Earth is amazing, and I wasn't particularly scared to not get Dimension Door because of Spellbinder's hat. But since I have all the spells I need on my Tazar, I'm taking the helm. In this scenario, we have to defeat Purple, again. We start with up to the 6 strongest heroes from the previous scenario, as well as Catherine and Lord Hart, who both cannot die in this scenario, or else we lose. Which is no problem, as I intend on using Tazar only. I start with 3 towns, 1 rampart, 1 castle, and 1 tower. All these towns are very well built up already, which is a great bonus. In the rampart town, mage guild level 5 is already built as well, so even there I have another option of getting dimension door. Purple starts with 2 built up necro towns, so I don't get any macro advantage in this one. So what is my strategy? Archangels of course, but before I get that far, I need to boost up my Tazar a fair bit. I town portal to the castle town, which Catherine spawns nearby. Trading over the archers that she and Lord Hart start with, as well as the helm Catherine has, I upgrade the archers to marksmen and recruit the available marksmen as well, leaving me with 21 marksmen to start with. 
all the side heroes' jobs are to gather resources so I can build the Portal of Glory as soon as possible. Tazar's objectives are all around the Northern Tower Town, to visit the library and later take on the Griffin Conservatory. In order to take on the Conservatory, I need an Angel, so until I get that, Tazar will just go around resource collecting and stat boosting. Already on day 3, I trade the necessary resources to build the Portal of Glory and recruit the Angel. I immediately town portal to the tower town and dimension door to the liches guarding the artifacts, resources and the coveted griffin conservatory. With Tazar's massive stats, the 13 liches cannot stand up to the one angel. I make sure to pick up all the resources as well, as they will be used to fund the upgraded portal of glory in the nearby future. You might be thinking, isn't it a bit risky to go for the conservatory with only one angel? What if it's a maxi? Well, from previous attempts, even a maxi is possible with good spell casting, which I have in this one as well. This time, I get the second smallest conservatory, which makes the fight quite a bit easier. Turn 1, I mass slow, which lets me kite the griffins around. Turn 2, I implosion the closest griffin stack, which one shots the griffins. I could just implode all the griffin stacks, that's quite mana intensive, so I'd rather not do that and I'm even one mana short of being able to do so. What I can do instead is Lightning Bolt, which takes out 17 Griffins per cast. A follow-up attack from the Angel then takes out the remaining 3, and so by using this combination on all the stacks, the rest of the fight is trivial from this point on. Winning this fight nets me 2 more Angels. With my now 3 Angels, I move toward purple territory. Seems a bit risky, doesn't it? They have fully built up towns, and I have only 3 angels and basically no mana? Fear not, there is a magic well close to my dimension door ending point, and also the best sword in the game, the Sword of Judgment. Equipping this sword nets me a gargantuan 21, 26, 21, 22 stat line, which is quite good for a day 6 hero. Dimension dooring down in front of the first purple town, I split my angels into 1 stacks and attack. This should be trivial, right? How could a quick combat lose? Well, remember the armor bug I talked about? Yeah, this is where it comes into play. With expert armor at level 16, Tazar's units take 27% more damage from the arrow towers, which hurts a lot. Arrow towers do more damage the more buildings are built in a town as well, so with these factors combined, it hurts even more. 180 damage from one round of arrow towers is massive. Luckily, the ace up my sleeve is Chain Lightning which just one-shots all the stacks defending the town. So, it was trivial in the end, but still, that armor bug is quite annoying. Looking for the purple heroes, I cast an absolutely atrocious Dimension Door into some cursed ground. If I had the brain capacity to cast Fly before Dimension Door, this would just be a silly haha -ha mistake. Now it's a jeez, how dumb am I mistake. Essentially a whole day wasted. Oh well. Day 1 the next week, I've upgraded the Portal of Glory and can recruit two Archangels as well as upgrading the three Angels I already have. This is quite the army for week 2, I must say. I also, once again, build the stables to increase movement points. Time to hunt down purple. First on the victim list is the Audacious Vidomina. After a quick round of Chain Lightning and Archangel Assault, Vidomina desperately tries to take me out with a Death Ripple, to no avail. Get Vidominated. Going back to the Necro Town, I Dimension Door North to find the last purple town. Just blazing past the Straker on the way. As you can see, the town is fully built up with even extra creature growth from external dwellings. Taking too long on this map is risky. Straker, of course, has to attack because purple is out of towns. A well placed Chain Lightning and some undead creature meat grinder action from the Archangels, and Straker is down. The stat difference as well as the armor difference are just too big to overcome for poor purple. Going underground, I find Malcolm, who I just quick combat down. Using view air to look for more heroes, I see the only purple hero left is quite close to my rampart town. A town portal and two dimension doors later, I find Vokial wandering around with an absolutely pathetic army. It's in the bag now. Taking out the seven whites, I finish the campaign with the overkill of a lifetime, an 1875 damage implosion on a single 20 HP zombie. Gotta rub it in sometimes. A lot of prep work going into the first two scenarios makes the final one kind of a cakewalk, 
that I'm satisfied with my own play, apart from the silly dead end I mentioned or though. Arathia is restored, I hope, I haven't really read the campaign text, but I will leave you with this epic 1999 cinematic. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment and or subscribe, it truly means the world to me. I hope you have a fantastic day, hey do! Throughout my life, my father emphasized my duty to the kingdom and my duty to justice. Today, I did both by delivering to my father, Lord Hart, the traitor who poisoned him and imprisoned his soul in an undead corpse. When I came to Arathia, it was to mourn a great king and a loving father. Your enemies have waged war to prevent me from seeing you one last time. I have driven them from the land. They will not disturb your eternal slumber ever again. Great victories and great tragedies have marked the Griffinheart history. Your death brings an end to the Restoration War and the Griffinheart lineage. I will miss you dearly, Father, and think of you often. Rest in peace. Aha! Uh -huh. You might have thought the previous video was the pinnacle of restoration of Arathia campaign gameplay. It wasn't. We're peaking today. So, strap in, grab some vegetables and dip, because we're playing Rampart. The rules are on screen for a few seconds. If you enjoyed this type of video, please leave a comment, like or subscribe. Alright, let's crack on lads! Seeds of Discontent is basically a how to grail campaign. If you couldn't figure it out yourself how the grail works. I'm just saying, I could figure it out as a 7 year old kid, so this campaign really shouldn't be necessary. But here we are. Only thing carried from scenario to scenario in this 3 part campaign is the grail and its effect. First scenario, go. The fitting name, the grail, is first up. Surprisingly enough, this is a really tough one to do deathless. The scenario bonus choices include boots of speed, which is a great artifact, some gold, which is useless in this scenario, and 4 pegasi which are necessary for my early fighting strategy. So, Pegasi it is. The goal of this scenario is to find and dig up the Grail. No enemy factions are present. Finding the Grail is done by visiting a bunch of obelisks scattered around a small map, which will reveal the Grail location on a puzzle map. The Grail location is always in the same general area, a highly guarded area to the north, so that's where we're headed. I start with three fixed heroes, Mephala, Yulun and Malcolm. A nice old bunch of lasses and lads. I reset a bunch until I start with some elves on Mephala. I'm building in town on the first two days and then never again afterwards, as there is basically nothing to build except for mage guild levels. So mage guild level 1 and 2 is on the menu. The spells I'm looking for are blind and magic arrow. Slow is a nice bonus, but not necessary. Haste could also come in handy, and incredibly enough, I get all these spells this time around. Good start. The map provides me with a lot of free units. I pick up the free centaur captains in town and set out on my merry way. The dragonbone greaves on the path south is also a really nice artifact, as it makes my spells quite a bit more useful. Both Yulin and Malcolm visit the obelisks and are provided with some free army as well. The battle dwarves are mostly useless, but the centaur captains will have a lot of use early. I also recruit Thorgrim, basically just to get some more army. The first fight is up next which is against a fixed amount of archers and marksmen who ambush me. The map is littered with ambush fights like this. Due to my 2 power, the magic arrow I cast on the marksman will always take them out. I then move forward with the now one stacked pegasi, in order to draw the shots from the archers to them instead of on the much weaker centaurs. Which works! The elves, meanwhile, just fire at whatever feels right. Turn 2, I just massacre the extremely melee weak archers with my centaurs and pegasi. Without the 4 pegasi, this fight is extremely difficult to do. Possibly impossible. Now, the idea is to level up Mephala as much as possible before the next difficult fights. 
I achieved this by fighting basically everything I can on the map. Everything has to be manually fought though, which is quite time consuming. The fight against the pikemen and halberdiers, for instance, takes about a minute of maneuvering around and whittling down with the elves, before going in for the kill with the bigger centaur stacks. Clean sweep. I'm not really looking for any skills in particular. Earth magic would be nice in order to use mass slow, but other than that, everything goes. I do already have armor, which is the best skill to have in this scenario, especially considering I don't have to siege anything. On day 4, Mephala visits a learning stone and a tree of knowledge reaching level 6. She meets up with Yulin, who trades over his centaurs and the clover of fortune he picked up the day before. Mephala then takes on lots of halberdiers, using the same strategy as in the previous fight. This time it's a little bit faster, as the centaurs now do enough damage to kill at least 9 halberdiers per hit. Much easier, and so much faster. I could move up on the west side to reach everything I need, but there are a couple of objectives I want on the east side as well, before I move towards the grail location. Taking on the 50 pikemen in the next fight, I used the exact same strategy as the previous two fights, with great success. Thorgrim then trades over his centaurs and the Lady Bird of Luck, which sets Mephala up nicely for the coming fights. The first two objectives I want on this side of the map are the other Learning Stone and the other Tree of Knowledge, pushing Mephala to level 8 already. More halberdiers are then disposed of before I move north. The Magic Well will come in very handy as I need the mana for a few fights soon. This fight against the centaur captains could actually sometimes be a run killer, since they move first. If either stacks gets morale, I lose at least an elf, and there is zero counterplay. This is where haste comes in handy though, as it lets my centaurs outspeed and take the captains out in two clean hits. Four grand elves then join my army, before I scare away the archers. I don't want to risk losing anything against ranged units if I don't have to. The archers guard the final important objective on this side of the map, the homestead. Picking up 14 elves in total from this is very nice, I have to say. Yulin and Malcolm are now retired, but Thorgrim is Mephala's bitch for the rest of this scenario. His job is to follow her around, taking the units Mephala doesn't need anymore and running some small errands from time to time. In the meantime, I'm ambushed again, this time by some traitorous elves. The grandest ones are immediately ice bolted to smithereens. I wait with all my melee units and shoot with both my elf stacks. The power of Mephala's armor comes into play, as even though all the enemy elves focus my own elf stack, they only lose 9 HP. Nice! I then move forward with my centaurs and pegasi, and on turn 2 I smack the elves back to Narnia, finding a spyglass after winning the fight. Good stuff! I then take on some centaurs. At this point, you might be asking, why are you showing all these fights? Well, dear viewer, literally all of these fights have some risk of losing units. If they didn't, I probably wouldn't show them, the same way I've done in previous videos. But this is the most risk-heavy scenario in this series so far. Alright, week 2, day 1. 40 mana, big army. Time to face the biggest obstacle in this scenario. The garrison. Dun dun dun! The trick to this fight is to prevent the marksmen and archers to hit my centaur stacks, and to avoid taking melee hits on either of my elf stacks. This is trickier than it looks, as I need to use some more advanced fight tactics, which leads me to a question. Would you be interested in a video on some more advanced fight tactics and how to abuse RNG in this game? Because I have had some plans to do this, but I'm not sure the interest is really there. Anyway, in order to protect my centaurs, I first blind the marksmen. Wait with the centaur captains, move forward with all my pegasi, and hit the archers with my grand elves. I then defend with my regular centaurs. This disincentivizes the archers from hitting the centaurs, so they instead go for the elves, who survive after the archers have been hit down to a stack of 12. The AI moves all its melee units forward towards the elves, which leaves the marksman stack free to be hit by the centaur captains the next turn. But first, I blind the griffin stack which is the most threatening creature stack on the AI side now. I then move all the pegasi away from the AI's melee units, blocking my centaurs in. So it was kind of a stupid way to place my units, but oh well. The archers then do a massive 3 damage to my centaur captains after being hit down to a stack of 3 by both my elf stacks. Next turn I start Operation Kite the Pikemen and Halberdiers. This is also the last turn the griffins are blinded, so I have to account for this as well. 
Having the centaur captains on the right side of the battlefield entices the pikemen to move away from the halberdiers, letting me take out the halberdiers with the now hasted centaur stack. Blinding the griffins again, I wait with my hasted centaurs and move away with my centaur captains, before hitting the pikemen with my elves. I want to guarantee the centaurs can kill the pikemen in one hit, which requires a bit of whittling down. The next turn, I realize I've painted myself into a bit of a corner. I can't guarantee both a one hit on the pikemen and the griffins, so I have to risk a hit on the griffins before the blind runs out. The centaurs take out 9 of them, getting hit back for a measly 1 damage. Whew. All calculated, of course. Retaliation then takes out the final griffin. Hits from the grand elves and the centaur captains take out the pikemen, and it's a job well done. This fight is intense, and took a lot of trial and error in the practice runs, and is up there with the general kennel fight in terms of difficulty in a challenge like this. I swing by the magic well to restore my mana before continuing on. I scare away the griffins, recruit 5 more pegasi before crossing my fingers I don't have to fight the pegasi right in front of me. But I have to. These can be a pain in the neck as well, if they get morale as there is no counterplay. Luckily, they don't, and I can cast slow on the closest stack of pegasi. I move the centaurs down in order to set up hits on the following turn. I take out a bunch of them with my elves, and on the next turn, the not slowed stack moves into range. I need to do 232 damage to guarantee a KO, but I don't expect to take the 10 damage necessary to lose a centaur if I don't take out all of the pegasi and have to take a retal. So I go for it, and it's a clean kill. The slow stack is then hit with my elves, and then the centaur captains for an easy win. I purposefully move to take the swordsman fight, as there's an ambush attack close to the gold mine, which is much harder to do, so the swordsman is the safer option. A bit of ice bolt action and some big hits from the centaurs, and this fight is over and done. Moving towards the obelisk, I'm joined by 20 wood elves, who may come in handy later. Next objective on the map is crucial for the late game strategy, the hill fort. I start by upgrading everything on Mephala before moving towards the next big objective, the Dragon Cliffs. On the way there, I scare away some cavaliers before I'm given an Armor of Wonder and joined by 15 unicorns, making my life a lot easier. Scaring away the second set of cavaliers, I take on the Dragon Cliffs. I split the unicorns into 5 stacks in the middle part of my army layout, as this will make the dragons come forward to hit the unicorns which lets me hit them with my Grand Elves, then take them out with a stack of Unicorns. Easy peasy. I recruit the Dragon, upgrade it and the Unicorns at the Hillfort, and trade over everything else to Thorgrim. Now it's time to clear the map. I get the Northeast Obelisk, some Permastats, and a couple of extra Unicorns. I then get the next Obelisk to the West, again joined by 20 Wood Elves, which are traded over to Thorgrim in exchange for this week's Gold Dragon. Next up is the Northwest Obelisk, some permastats and a couple of extra unicorns. The next week I pick up a buckler of the Null King from the tomb before picking up the final third dragon. Upgrading it, I face the final ambush fight of this scenario. Bunch of traitors, I mean unicorns and grand elves. Ice bolting the bottom stack of elves, I wait with both my units, luring the AI forward. Since the weakest stacks are up top, I hit them first. I get a bit of luck and morale which is earned due to Mephala's leadership and luck skills, and also her artifacts. I magic arrow the Grand Elves to death before hitting the final unupgraded unicorn stack. Next turn, I shield my unicorns and hit with my dragons. The AI's unicorns then hit my dragons for some reason, before I hit back with my own unicorns. Getting a lucky hit and then blinding. Still completely fine by me. All calculation, no fortune. I take out the bottom stack with yet another completely okay luck hit, and take out the final unicorn stack with my own unicorns. Excellent tactics on my part. I then realize I've missed an obelisk, which I just sent Thorgrim down to visit. No problem. The final obelisk reveals the grail's location, which is at the very top of the grail area. I quick combat some newbie unicorns and dendroids before I take on some angels. And there's an archangel stack. You have to be kidding me. For some reason, the Archangels hit my gold dragons, thankfully. I slow the three angel stack and wait with both my units. The slowed angels move forward, only to be absolutely obliterated by my unicorns. 
I then take advantage of the AI's terrible positioning to Dragon Breath both the remaining Angel stacks. And with some highly calculated morale, I even do it twice. Well played to me. Good fights. Quick combating some more trees, and I double check I stand in the correct position to dig up the Grail before ending my turn. If you're unaware, you need a full day's movement to dig up the Grail. Month 2, week 1, day 5, the Grail is dug up and victory is achieved. Absolutely no RNG involved in the later fights. Nuh uh. All excellent play and completely reproducible by anyone using the same strategies. Even though the actual gameplay wasn't that long, the number of fights I had to do manually and strategize in some way is so high compared to the other scenarios in previous videos. To put it in perspective, this script is almost 6 pages long, the longest for a single scenario so far in a 4 fun campaign. Ridiculous. I can guarantee you though that the next two scenarios will be much 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 shorter. On to the next. The road home is the next scenario. The scenario bonuses are either mage guild level 3, 5000 gold or 3 dendroid soldiers. As I won't build anything except the grail in my starting town or recruit any creatures from dwellings and such, only the dendroid soldiers are potentially useful, so that's my choice. The only objective in this scenario is to bring the grail from the top left corner to my starting town. The grail is on Ryland and he has to charge through many neutral creatures and two enemy factions using only his starting army. Challenging stuff. I reset until I get a no dwarf start. I'm a strong independent ranger and I don't need no dwarf. <clears throat> yeah. Anyways, picking up the spyglass and getting experience from the chests, you can notice Ryland has diplomacy. I wonder if that will come in handy in this scenario. Hmm. I go straight east. And what is that pop-up message? Dendroids might be sympathetic to our cause? Hmm. I check up on the nearby dendroids, who are soldiers by the way, and wow! They join us! I say hi to some more trees, and to my surprise, they join as well! I then go back west and then south. And what is that pop-up message? Swordsmen might be sympathetic to our cause. Hmm. And there are some swordsmen right there. Hmm. Going directly there and surprise surprise, they join! Picking up some more experience and we get expert diplomacy. Might still be useful that. Some dendroid guards are further south and of course they join- They fight us? All dendroids are super slow, so this should be doable. I move my forces towards the bottom of the battlefield to focus down the cutoff stack and they get a morale turn. Thankfully, they leave my guards with 6 HP left. I hit them back and take them out, but now I only have one real stack to take hits, the dendroid soldiers. On turn 3 I wait with all my units, before I hit the top stack with my soldiers, taking only 20 damage in retaliation. This makes them weak enough to be taken out by my swordsman. So I just use that exact same strategy the next turn to take out the final 5 trees. Quick is not the correct word to describe this battle with an average speed of about 4, but it was efficient. Moving on, I find some more trees, which tie into my army for a small sum of gold. Some swordsmen also accompany me, and some more swordsmen then marry me? Hope you will come to my wedding. Do I need all these swordsmen? Probably not, but you never know. I walk straight past the red town before some battle dwarves want to scrap it out, but they're just brushed aside easily. Both red and blue are pissing their pants at the sight of my army, and they probably aren't less frightened when they see the unicorns associate with me. I then head straight for the Pegasi, and to all of our surprise, they also intermix with my diverse army. Yes, I know the commentary is extremely varied, there are only so many ways you can say creatures join my army. With all these neutral creatures agglutinated, we reach our final destination and build a coveted grail in our new home. Scenario complete. The final scenario in all of Restoration of Arathia is independence. Mark your calendars, the 7th of April is our independence day! And the scenario bonus choice is between 12 wood, 3 upgraded animated wood piles and 6 normal animated wood piles. Without spoiling too much, there's not a single fight necessary in this scenario, so I'm going with the resources. The 12 wood that is. The goal of this scenario is extremely simple. Build a capital. The game robs us of our starting wood, with the exception of the 12 wood I chose for the bonus. 
The Grail is pre-built, so I have plus 5,000 gold extra per day. The strategy is simple. Build stuff required for the capital. Town Hall is built on day one. Euphraten's job is just to pick up the free resources and then just chill afterwards with his dwarf buddies. As the game will steal some wood every now and then, I build a marketplace next, so I can trade up for some wood if needed. Day 3, blacksmith. Day 4, I get minus 1 wooded, and the first trading has to take place. I'm swimming in gold, so I trade a bunch of it for the 4 wood needed for a mage guild. Day 5, I'm hoodwinked of 4k gold, but that doesn't stop me from buying a city hall. Minus 3500 gold next, and I'm out of wood. Good thing citadels don't need wood to be built. Day 7, and I have to trade a bunch of resources for the 10 wood needed to build a castle. Every resource except ore is traded, and I'm literally out of everything except gold before the next week. Thankfully, I'm not bothered by the AI, and on week 2, day 1, I build a capital and claim my victory. Amazingly difficult stuff at the end there. I'm proud I managed to pull such a rabbit out of the hats. But, with all that said and done, Restoration of Arathia is actually done for real this time. No units lost at all. So, I can safely say, yes, Heroes of Might and Magic 3 Restoration of Arathia can really, actually, seriously, in fact, truly, literally, and genuinely be done without the unit losses. Thanks for watching. I hope you'll stick with me in the future as well. Some other games possibly coming up, and I will definitely take a look at Armageddon's Blade at some point too. Anyways, have a great day.